Today, I'm tackling a list that I've wanted to discuss for a while, the top 10 player-to-player -player rivalries in NBA history. Now obviously, there's no such thing as an objectively correct list when it comes to this kind of category, and there's a lot of different things to factor in when determining the list. So let me quickly skim over the different aspects I'll be considering when ranking this list. First is how often the rivals competed against one another. Second is the significance of the games when the rivals competed against one another. Third is how much the rivals personally dislike one another, especially when they were competing. And fourth, how good the players are certainly matters as well, because nobody gives a darn about two scrubs having a beef. So without further ado, let's get into it. Number 10, Larry Bird vs. Julius Irving. As a rookie, Larry Bird was entering the NBA at the same time that Dr. J was in the prime of his career. Irving 76ers were the established force in the Eastern Conference, while the Boston Celtics were the new rising power. These two teams met in the playoffs for the first three seasons of Bird's career, and four times in total. And there were some epic battles between the two biggest superstars in the conference. Even their regular season matches were intense. They looked like anything but friends when they had this famous altercation. Honestly, I contemplated having this rivalry even higher, but without question, it's certainly deserving of a spot in the top 10. Number 9. Kevin Durant vs. Russell Westbrook These two don't have the longest history of battles in the playoffs, as they've actually only met up once in the postseason as adversaries. But what they do have is many strong years together as teammates, before it all ended on a sour note, sparking one of the most famous beefs in modern history. There was name calling, there was face to face jawing at one another, and there was must see TV as both superstars were determined to destroy and embarrass each other in front of a live audience. These stars had nearly all the right ingredients for a top 5 rivalry. But without a deep history of playoff battles, they'll just have to settle for the ninth spot on the list. Number 8. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar vs. Wilt Chamberlain After many years battling against Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain was finally ready to have the center spotlight all to himself at the end of the 1969 season. But just then, a rookie Lou Alcindor, now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, exploded onto the scene and became the new rival immediately. At first, the players were friendly and cordial towards one another, but both players were really outspoken about what they believe. And once they realized that they were on complete opposite ends of the political spectrum, their rivalry intensified. The two superstar giants met in the playoffs in 1971 and in 1972, and each legend won a round before ultimately winning the championship. It wasn't the longest lasting rivalry seeing how Wilt retired after the completion of Kareem's fourth season, but regardless, it was intense while it lasted. Number 7. Larry Bird vs. Isaiah Thomas After ruling the 80s for the first half of the decade, the Celtics found themselves in many dogfights in the second half against the rising power in the conference, the bad boy Detroit Pistons. Without question, there was bad blood between the two teams, as there was always physical and intense interactions whenever they met up, which was incredibly often. Along with their regular season matches, the two teams met up four times in the East playoffs during the 80s. The rivalry was already strong, but Isaiah Thomas added fuel to the fire when he echoed Dennis Rodman's comments, saying that Larry Bird would be just another player if he wasn't white. A very, very good basketball player. I think he's an exceptional talent, but I'd have to agree with Rodman. If he was black, he'd be just another good guy. <laughs> If there was any doubt that their bitterness was still strong, Bird just about confirmed it when he immediately fired Isaiah Thomas as the Indiana Pacers head coach the instant Bird took over as the general manager. Number 6. Kevin Garnett vs. Tim Duncan For a while, these two power forwards were in a heated battle for the title of the best at the position. Beyond that, they had met up twice in the Western Conference playoffs, with Duncan Spurs winning both matchups. 
One of the interesting dynamics about their rivalry was the contrast in their personalities. Duncan was a quiet and reserved leader who led by example, while Garnett was about as vocal and animated as one person can be. As many of you viewers probably know, there is plenty of stories about the intense trash talk in this rivalry, which allegedly became very personal from Garnett. Number 5. Kobe Bryant vs Shaquille O'Neal Famously, they spent eight seasons together in Los Angeles and won three NBA championships as teammates. Yet even while they were wearing the same jersey, they still seemed like rivals at some points. Their split in 2004 was extremely toxic to say the least. Both players were making negative comments about one another to the media, and both players were determined to prove that they could win a championship without the other. Although they never met in the NBA playoffs as adversaries, without question, they accounted for some of the most highly anticipated regular season battles in NBA history, and they almost never disappointed. It was a unique rivalry in the sense that the two players didn't play against each other relatively as much. But after the split, there was certainly a competitive connection that the two could never disassociate from. One of the first things out of Shaq's mouth when he won his fourth championship was Kobe. And one of the first things out of Kobe's mouth when he won his fifth championship was Shaq. Number 4. LeBron James vs Steph Curry Even recently, more pages have been added to the book of their rivalry. It started out in 2015 when they first met in the NBA Finals, but things really heated up the following year when Steph Curry became the first unanimous MVP winner and even had some people claiming that he had replaced LeBron James as the new face of the NBA, just for LeBron to shut down that narrative emphatically in the 2016 Finals. In total, the stars have met up five times in the NBA playoffs, including four straight years in the NBA Finals. And despite the fact that they're now both in their late 30s, it's still up for grabs on who's walking away with a better career. Number 3. Michael Jordan vs Isaiah Thomas There are rivalries where players have a fierce yet friendly competition. And then there are rivalries where you get the sense that both parties generally don't like one another. But Isaiah and Michael have a rivalry that's even more rare than that, as they have an obvious hatred that burns for one another many decades later. The Bad Boy Pistons famously implemented the Jordan Rules, where they would physically punish MJ any time he got close to the basket. Along with that, these two teams met up for four straight years in the NBA playoffs, with the Pistons winning the first three before Jordan's Bulls finally broke through in 1991. Then you have Isaiah getting eliminated and walking off the court without shaking hands with MJ. And you have MJ allegedly keeping Thomas off the 1992 Dream Team. This rivalry had the talent, the frequency, the stakes, and the necessary bitterness to give it a top 3 spot. Number 2. Wilt Chamberlain vs Bill Russell it was one of the first superstar rivalries of NBA history, and thanks to the fact that it was two of the most athletically gifted centers of all time, it's been able to stand the test of time. These two legends accounted for 11 straight championships as they completely defined that era of basketball. Although they were friendly off the court, they were always competitive on it, with many moments becoming heated. Not only did this rivalry have the significance and talent categories, but the frequency was on a level of their own, as they would play against each other as many as 17 times a year between the regular season and the postseason. I imagine you gotta be getting pretty tired of your opponent at that point. Number 1. Magic Johnson vs Larry Bird this rivalry completely defined the era of 1980s basketball, and it also saved the NBA from its tanking viewership. Two team-first, passionate competitors who were all consumed by the desire to best one another. Either Bird's Celtics or Magic's Lakers were in the NBA Finals every single season of that decade, and those two teams battled it out three times in the championship series. Some of the most memorable and iconic plays of NBA history came from that rivalry, and the league has been reaping the benefits ever since. 
Here's my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these rivalries have been in the top 10 instead? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments section below. Today's video is something I've wanted to do for a while, but I also have to point out the silliness of the topic itself. There is no objective way to possibly rank the greatest dunkers in NBA history. It essentially boils down to each person's personal opinions. Which dunkers made you ooh and ah the most? The answers are going to be different for basically everyone. So please, keep this a fun activity in the comment section, because it's really not that serious. Now as far as how my list works, here are the things I'm factoring in. 1. How creative the dunkers were. 2. How high of a leaper they were. 3. The power in the dunking. 4. The mesmerizing in-game dunks. And 5. How they typically did in the dunk contest. Obviously, a combination of all of these things is going to be great for a dunker's chances. But you also have to consider how some dunkers will be extremely strong in certain areas while lacking in others. All of it is subject to scale, and this is simply my list based off of this criteria. So without further ado, let's get into it. Number 10. LeBron James Two negative aspects are working against him. First is obviously the fact that he's never participated in a single dunk contest. And the second is somewhat debatable, is that he doesn't have a tremendous amount of variety in his dunks. But the areas he specializes in are elevation and power. Simply put, LeBron has some of the most ferocious dunks I've ever seen, and oftentimes they were against all-time great defenders, like Tim Duncan and Kevin Garnett for example. Even without a dunk contest victory on his resume, he still has plenty of thunderous iconic slams which makes him worthy of a spot on this list. Number 9. Jason Richardson if you want creativity, this guy has got it. Although Jason was never considered as a superstar player, for a while, he was probably considered as a top dunker in the NBA, as he won several slam dunk contests over the course of his career. Whether it was reverse slams, lob finishes, windmills, or East Bay dunks, Richardson had it all. Relatively, he may have been a bit lacking in the power department, but there's very few dunk variations that Jason couldn't have pulled off. Number 8. Kobe Bryant As one of the most famous athletes of all time, there's very few things that Kobe is underrated in, but I feel like dunking is one of them. Most lists do not have him in their top 10, but he certainly belongs, as he had an insane combination of creativity, power, and originality. For example, his baseline dunk against the Minnesota Timberwolves, where he sucked the gravity out of the target center, is among the most impressive and difficult dunks that I've ever seen in my life. If longevity counts for anything, the Mamba has that as well, as he was posterizing defenders from the age of 18 all the way until he was 34. Add in the fact that he was the 1997 dunk contest champion, and I'm very comfortable with his placement at 8. Number 7. Ja Morant At only 6 foot 3 inches tall, Morant is one of those players that gives the incredible illusion that he's flying through the air. He is the first person on my list since LeBron to fail to win the dunk contest, but personally, I don't think he needs it to earn this spot. Quite simply, Ja has some of the nastiest, ugliest, and disrespectful dunks that I've ever seen. Now if he can just stop bringing the heat on Instagram, and instead consistently bring the heat on the court, he might actually climb up a few spots on the list before his career is all said and done. Number 6. Blake Griffin This man absolutely took the NBA by storm with his awe-inspiring dunk fest. The way he absolutely humiliated guys like Timothy Moskov and Kendrick Perkins is something I will never forget. Like LeBron, creativity isn't his strong suit, but he consistently made stadiums explode with his rim-shaking slams. During his first few seasons in the NBA, no big man was safe, a painful lesson that the Lakers' Pau Gasol learned the hard way. And with his dunk contest victory in 2011, I believe he makes a solid choice at 6. Number 5. Michael Jordan I can hear it now. Jordan fans scrambling to grab their torches and pitchforks. 
Personally, I think Jordan gets a little extra credit on most dunkers lists simply because of who he is and the appeal of his superstardom. With that being said, I'm still comfortable having him as a top 5 dunker, considering the fact that he made a living posterizing some of the greatest rim protectors of all time, like Patrick Ewing, Alonzo Mourning, and Dikembe Mutombo. If the list was simply the most iconic dunkers of all time, Jordan would easily be on top as he has his insane cradle dunks and his dunk contest winning free throw line dunks. Although MJ excelled in creativity and leaping ability, you could argue that he left some to be desired in the power department, as he would somewhat regularly finish softly when he actually got to the rim. Number 4. Sean Kemp He was one half of the original Lob City in Seattle, and he was simply one of the meanest power dunkers of all time. For some reason, Kemp always tried to dunk the basketball as if the rim had just insulted his mama. Obviously, we have to consider his slam on Alton Lister, which is quite possibly the most disrespectful dunk in the history of the game. Naturally, with this placement on my list, I believe he's the greatest dunker to never win a dunk contest. But quite frankly, I'm extremely comfortable with that being the case. Number 3. Zach Levine Zach is one of those rare breeds who had a little bit of everything, like leaping ability, creativity, elegance, and even some ferocity. He did mind-blowing things that we once thought were impossible, like windmill dunks from the free throw line. In 2016, he won his second straight dunk contest championship, and he did it over quite possibly the most impressive loser in dunk contest history, Aaron Gordon. And honestly, I was one of the few people who was actually okay with it. Very few players have been able to glide through the air the way that this man did. And for that, he's certainly top 3 for me. Number 2. Dominique Wilkins Personally, I've had this man firmly in my number 2 spot since the early 2000s. And that's mostly for the fact that he has an argument for being the best in-game dunker of all time. Wilkins would try to dunk on anyone and everyone during his prime, and although he had power that was similar to Sean Kemp, he also had a flair and gracefulness reminiscent to Julius Irving. He won two dunk contest championships during his career, and many people believe that he should have won his third in his classic battle with Michael Jordan in 1988. There's a reason why the NBA's official YouTube page has a 10 minute compilation video of just Dominique dunking, and it's because he was one of the most frequent, aggressive, and unforgiving dunkers of all time. It takes a darn near perfect dunker to keep the human highlight film from taking the number one spot. More on that in a bit. But first, here's my list of honorable mentions. Just how much of a dumb, no good, filthy casual am I for not having these guys in the top 10? Let me know below. Number 1. Vince Carter Was there ever any doubt? Vince Sanity was the perfect blend of force and style. In 2000, he put on one of the most incredible and memorable shows in dunk contest history that had some of the most genuine reactions of amazement that I've ever seen from a spectating audience. Then you have to look at everyone he absolutely abused with his awesome in-game dunking, as he regularly made 7-footers look completely helpless as they stood in his path. If there was any doubt that he was the greatest dunker of all time heading into the summer of 2000, he completely ended that when he leapt clear over the 7-foot 2-inch Frederick Weiss, which has since been named the Dunk of Death and is seen by many, including yours truly, as the greatest dunk of all time. When it comes to the art of the slam dunk, Vince Carter is the Leonardo da Vinci. I would say that he was the Michael Jordan of dunking, but Michael Jordan is already here. So, yeah. So this is a video I've been wanting to make for a while, as it seems to be a hot topic in the media, and it also seems to be a frequent topic of debate between me and my friends. Just who are the top 10 three-point shooters in NBA history? Sure, you could just look at the all-time list for total three-pointers made and determine the top 10 that way. But let's be honest, if you want a genuine discussion about who the best shooters were, then it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. 
For some perspective, here's a chart that shows how the volume of three-pointers attempted have been rapidly increasing since its implementation in 1979. I guarantee you that if Steph Curry played at this point in the 80s, he wouldn't have attempted as many three-pointers in his career. That's just not something that they had embraced yet at that point, even though they still had some solid three-point shooters. But that's just one area of nuance that I'm looking at. Here are six different categories that I will be factoring in. First off is obviously efficiency. Making a lot of three-pointers alone isn't going to get high on the list but the player also has to be making them at a high rate. The second category is volume. In a similar way, a player can't simply be efficient while being extremely selective with his attempts. A higher volume of threes are needed alongside of that efficiency. The third category is a variety of three-point shots. For example, many players have had great percentages over their careers, but they did it primarily as spot-up shooters. If a player can create his own three-point shot, if he can shoot off the dribble, coming off screens, and so on, then it will help him move higher up the list. The fourth category is their all-time ranking for total three-pointers made. Although it's not the only factor, it still counts for something. Fifth is the inflation of threes and how good the players were relative to their own era. And the sixth and last category is how they did in three-point contests. Without a doubt, this is the least important category. But again, I think it counts for something. Some people laugh at the suggestion of three-point shots being factored in, but then for some reason don't apply that same logic to the dunkers and the dunk contests. For me, it all matters. So now that we're on the same page, let's get into the list. Number 10, Steve Kerr. He was primarily a spot-up shooter, and from a statistical standpoint, he was the most efficient three-point shooter in NBA history, as he hit a career 55.4% from deep. For that incredibly efficient sniping, some may think that he needs to be toward the top of the list. But he wasn't the type of shooter to create his own shot, and beyond that, he didn't attempt many threes per game, since he was just a role player off the bench. In the 95-96 season, he shot a career-high 2.9 three-point attempts per game, but even in that era, that only ranked him 62nd overall that season. So again, if you have an open three-point shot, there may be no better option than Kerr. But because there's so much more that goes into it, he only barely squeezes into my top 10. Number 9. James Harden as things currently stand, James Harden is third on the NBA's all-time list in total three-pointers made. And it's only a matter of time before he passes Ray Allen to secure the second spot. James has certain aspects down to a science. At his peak, he could easily create his own three-point shots. As an insanely skilled ball handler, he could get up a shot basically any time he wanted. Now the reason why Harden isn't as high as his all-time ranking for total threes is because Harden is very much a volume three-point shooter. Over the course of his career, he was hitting 36.4% of his three-point attempts, which is generally above league average, but that's also the lowest career percentage of any player in this top 10. Number 8. Larry Bird This legend's ranking among the top shooters has been a point of contention over the last few years. Some think he's good enough to be a top three shooter in NBA history, while some think it's absurd to have him anywhere near the top 10. Obviously, by my ranking, I find myself somewhere in the middle. Bird was a rookie in the same season that the three-point shot was introduced to the NBA, so he was literally learning that shot as he was going through his professional career. Despite that, he still went on to shoot 37.9% throughout his career. His volume of three-point shots seems low by modern standards, but at one point, he was the leader in three-point attempts per game for two straight seasons. Bird also had every kind of three-point shot, as he could hit them off balance, he could pull up in transition, and he could catch and shoot. Throw in the fact that he won the three-point contest in three straight years, and yeah, he certainly deserves a spot on the list even without a tremendous volume. Number 7. Pesha Stoyakovich This guy has somehow become a generally unknown star of history's past. 
Throughout the entirety of his career, he was almost always among the league leaders and three-pointers attempted per game. He had a tremendous green light throughout the 2000s when less three-point shots were taken. I can only imagine how many he would be shooting if he played in this modern era. He was a career 40.1% shooter from distance, and at 6 foot 10 inches tall, he could get a good look just about any time he wanted. This is Peja's current ranking on the all-time list for three-pointers made, and the fact that he's this high on the list as a player who was drafted in the 90s, who retired in just his early 30s because of injuries, is utterly insane. That should tell you how lethal he was from deep in his era. Number 6. Kyle Korver This absolute sniper was one of the most efficient role-playing shooters in the history of the game. He led the entire league in three-point percentage in four separate seasons. At his very best on the Atlanta Hawks in 2015, he was hitting an insanely reliable 49.2% from three-point range, while shooting six three-point attempts a night, which was 10th in the league in attempts per game. He had the efficiency and the volume, but the one thing he lacked was the ability to create a shot for himself. If he had that too, then he'd probably be in the top three rather than the top six. Number five, Damian Lillard. You all know this guy. He's basically in range the second he crosses half court. And although he might not be the most efficient player on the list at a career 37.2%, he certainly is near the top when it comes to volume, as he had three seasons where he shot at least 10 three-point attempts per game. On top of that, there's no kind of perimeter shot that Lillard can't hit regularly. As he can hit them while he's off balance, he can hit them off of screens, in transition, or from 35 feet out. He's also extremely clutch from three-point range, thanks to his ability to create space and get a good look for himself. When you take everything into consideration, he's worthy of a top five spot. Number four, Reggie Miller. Speaking of clutch three-point shooters, there's very few better than this guy, as Reggie built his entire reputation and legacy off of his elite perimeter game. Like Steph Curry, Miller used to travel all over the court without the ball, coming off screens and looking for opportunities to get up a quick shot. It didn't matter if he was off balance 30 feet out, or even if he was being fouled during the shot. There was always a good chance of it going in when Reggie was the one shooting it. He was always among the league leaders and attempts throughout the 90s, and he shot a career 39.5% from that distance, which naturally made him the standard of excellent perimeter shooting during his era. Number 3. Clay Thompson The second Splash Brother has had many famous moments from three-point range, especially in the playoffs. Beyond that, he is also the all-time record holder for the most three-pointers made in a single game, which was a total of 14 against the Chicago Bulls where he didn't even play in the fourth quarter. He's always dangerous from deep, but especially when he gets hot, defenses would be foolish to give him just a second of daylight. Over his career, he shot 41.4% from deep, while constantly being among the league leaders in attempts. Number 2. Ray Allen For a while, he was the NBA's all-time record holder for three-pointers made, and the fact that he's still in the top three despite playing in an earlier era of basketball is truly remarkable. Allen has a deep history of making clutch three-pointers, including arguably the most clutch shot in NBA Finals history. He shot a career 40% from three-point distance on a tremendously high volume of attempts, especially during his era. Many people often forget that he was a go-to superstar in his prime, and in those days, there was no question that Allen could get up quality shots of his own with his playmaking abilities. Before we get into the completely surprising number one spot, here's a look at the honorable mentions. Should any of these players have made the list instead? Let me know below. Number one, Steph Curry. Was there ever any doubt? This guy helped change the game with his incredible sniping, as he expedited the process of the NBA increasing its three-point shooting. Over his career, he's hitting around 42% of his three-point shots, on roughly nine attempts per game. 
his peak was nothing short of legendary as he made a record-breaking total of 402 three-point shots on a whopping 45.4% from deep. He has every kind of three-point shot in his bag. He's the NBA's all-time leader in three-pointers made and only continues to build upon his massive lead. Without question, he is the greatest three-point shooter of all time. So nearly two years ago, I made a video where I ranked my 50 greatest players of all time. Since then, a lot has changed as some modern players have continued to build their legacy while some others have regressed a bit. Along with that, I've actually changed my mind on a couple spots on this list. As time passes and you learn more about each player, your perspectives can begin to change. That happened to me in just a couple spots on this list. The reason why this video is a top 30 video instead of a top 50 is because most of the significant changes on the list took place in the top 30 spots. Now with all of this being said, this is just my list and my opinions, and in no way am I claiming that any spot on this list is an objective fact, but rather it just reflects my honest perspective. Now once you see it, you might think it's a wild list. But I honestly think a lot of lists online are very similar because people are too scared to give their honest rankings. I've seen just how angry people can get at a list, and I believe that social pressure incentivizes people to develop a general similar consensus. With that being said, that's not how I operate. This is my list based on my experiences, and people can cry, rage, or threaten me. I don't care. This is how I see it, and I want to know how you see it in the comment section below. So without further ado, let's get into it. Number 30, John Stockton. Naturally, he dropped just a bit on my list as modern superstars have been climbing their way up the ranks in the last two years. Stockton is one of the more controversial players on this list. I've seen the now famous criticism that he doesn't have a left hand. But listen, if Gary Payton says that you're the hardest player he's ever had to guard, then you know what you're doing. Stockton certainly wasn't anything flashy, but he was extremely fundamentally sound throughout the entirety of his career. He's one of those legends who excelled both in longevity and peak performance. Of the six seasons with the highest assist per game averages in NBA history, John Stockton has five of them, which is truly absurd. On top of that, he's the all-time leader in assists and steals, and neither category is remotely close. The one glaring omission from his resume is obviously an NBA championship. With one, he likely would have been in the top 20, but without it, he finds himself at the starting point of my list. Number 29, Kevin McHale. I feel like my fellow old heads will understand this ranking of McHale, but younger fans don't hear enough about the greatness of this legend. Before Nikola Jokic was the standard of efficiency for the big man, there was Kevin McHale. In the history of the NBA, only two players have averaged more than 20 points per game while shooting over 60% from the field and over 80% from the free throw line. They were Nikola Jokic and Kevin McHale. He was one of the most reliable, low-post threats that the game has ever seen, with footwork that is second only to Akeem Olajuwon. Along with that, his 8-foot-long wingspan made him a terrifying defender in the painted area. He was also tougher than 99% of the players in the league, as he put up these numbers in the 1987 Finals, while playing on a broken foot. Add six all-defense teams and three championship rings to his resume, and I'm very comfortable having the man known as the Torture Chamber this high on the list. Number 28, John Havlicek. If it wasn't for Bill Russell and Larry Bird, then I believe this man would be known as the greatest player in Celtics history. Havlicek was one of the all-time great two-way players, as he was a force from the perimeter on offense and a stifling antagonizer on defense. At his peak, he was averaging 28.9 points per game, and he made eight all-defense teams throughout his career, which is an achievement that only a few wing players have ever accomplished. More importantly than anything else, he was a pivotal star in the Celtics dynasty days, as he won a whopping eight championship rings throughout his playing career. He won his lone finals MVP in 1974, but he should have won several more, considering how the finals MVP award wasn't introduced to the NBA until 1969. Without Bill Russell, John Havlicek wouldn't be as successful as he was. But without John Havlicek, 
Bill Russell wouldn't have been as successful as he was either. Number 27. Dirk Nowitzki This legend was so ahead of his time, and this MVP winning 7-footer was one of the greatest perimeter shooters that the game has ever seen. He was certainly a more capable defensive player in his youth, but as he aged and as much of his quickness left him, he began to devolve into a below average defensive player, which keeps him from being higher on my list. With that being said, Dirk has one of, if not the, most impressive title runs in NBA history, where he led his Dallas Mavericks to defeat the Super Team Miami Heat in 2011. For his career as a whole, he made a total of 12 All-NBA teams, while putting up over 31,000 points, earning him the 6th spot on the NBA's all-time scoring list. Number 26. Nikola Jokic This man wasn't even in my top 50 two years ago, which tells you how great he's been of late. Simply, he's one of the most efficient and well-rounded offensive players that the game has ever seen, as he can distribute as well as just about anyone, while being an extremely accurate scorer from all areas of the court. He's won two MVPs and now a Finals MVP, while delivering the Denver Nuggets their first championship in franchise history. The only thing holding him back is his defensive play, that leaves much to be desired. With that being said, the Joker is the youngest player on this entire list, which means he has plenty of time to skyrocket up my list, which I believe he'll do. After all, Michael Jordan was the same age as Nikola Jokic when he won his first championship ring. Number 25. Giannis Due to recency bias, it might not be a popular opinion to have Giannis ranked slightly ahead of Jokic. But based on their accolades and their complete body of work so far, I believe Giannis maintains a slight edge. He has more All-NBA selections, infinitely more All-Defense Team selections, an equal amount of MVPs, and an equal amount of championships while being way ahead on the statistical all-time lists. Due to his recent failure, and yes, I will call it a failure, in the first round of the playoffs, Giannis hasn't done any climbing up the list since I originally did my 50 greatest, but he is the second youngest player in this group of 30, so I know for a fact that the two-way Greek freak is far from done climbing my list. Number 24, Kevin Garnett. KG is a player who I tend to rank higher than most people. One of my hottest takes is that there really isn't much of a difference between Tim Duncan and Kevin Garnett. It's just that one spent the majority of his playing days in the perpetually failing Minnesota organization, while the other had the stability and support of San Antonio. KG literally led the Timberwolves in every major stat category while he was in Minnesota. And then, when he finally joined a team built to contend, he immediately won the Defensive Player of the Year award and the championship, as he was just exiting the prime of his career. With him being one of the most well-rounded players on this list, I'm confident that the big ticket deserves to be as high as I've ranked him. Number 23, Carl Malone. The mailman actually dropped a couple spots since my original list, and it's for reasons that go beyond the current players climbing the list. I'll explain that in a second. Carl was one of the most consistent and dominant scorers throughout his long career, and he was a pretty solid rebounder and defender as well. Two major aspects prevent him from rivaling Tim Duncan in the conversation of the greatest power forwards in NBA history. For one, he had a nasty habit of turning the ball over as he has the second most turnovers in NBA history. If he was a distributing point guard, then his turnover statistic would be more acceptable, but as a power forward, it's just not. Along with that, Carl had several opportunities at winning a championship ring, but without one, it certainly limits his ranking on the all-time list. Number 22, David Robinson. It was only recently that I realized how controversial my higher ranking of Robinson is. Regardless of moments where he was outshined in the postseason, the Admiral still managed to get two championship rings, while being one of the greatest rim protectors in NBA history. He made eight all-defense teams throughout his career, and was the Defensive Player of the Year in 1992, which are achievements that Nikola Jokic can only dream of, which is who many people claimed I should have ahead of Robinson. But I don't believe he's earned that just yet. On top of Robinson's proven resume is an MVP award and a high ranking on many of the all-time statistical lists. Number 21, Dwayne Wade. 
Remember how I said Malone dropped an extra spot? Well, Dwayne Wade is the reason why, as I'm starting to feel like I ranked him too low on my original list. The Flash was a solid two-way player, and is in the conversation with Michael Jordan as the greatest shot-blocking guards in NBA history. He won three NBA championships, had an epic Finals MVP performance in 2006, and many people forget that he was probably the MVP of the 2008 Redeem Team, although Kobe and LeBron seemed to get all the shine. In a league with great former two guards like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, it's easy for Wade to be taken for granted, which is why I'm moving him a bit up my list. Number 20, Charles Barkley. Until the day I die, I'll be telling people that Charles Barkley was so much better than most people realize. Early in his career, he was a remarkable blend of strength, speed, and athleticism. He's quote, officially listed at 6'6", yet Barkley himself said that he's around 6'4". Regardless of which I claim, people in the chat always get mad at me. Regardless of what it actually is, Chuck always played way bigger than his height would suggest, as he was one of the greatest rebounders in NBA history to go along with the fact that he was one of the most efficient scorers of all time, as he was frequently shooting around 60% from the field during his prime. Add in the 1993 MVP, and I'm more than comfortable putting the round mound of rebound in my top 20. Number 19, Kevin Durant. He's one of the most skilled and most difficult players to guard that the league has ever seen. He was the league MVP in 2014, and just a season prior, he had a 50-40-90 year while averaging 28 points per game. He has won the NBA championship twice and was the finals MVP on both occasions. But I'm not gonna lie, I'm one of those people who don't believe that all rings are created equal. Joining a 73-9 team that just beat you when you choked away a massive series lead is not something that I'm simply gonna look past, and I'm certainly never gonna forget it. If Durant had won a ring before or after, then it would do a lot to validate himself, but he hasn't done that, which is why he isn't higher on my list regardless of his tremendous top 10 capable talent. Number 18, Elgin Baylor. For his size, he may have been the greatest rebounder to ever live, as he got as high as 19.8 rebounds per game at only the height of 6'5". Along with that, Baylor was the most prolific scorer in Lakers history until Kobe Bryant showed up as he has the NBA Finals record for the most points scored in a Finals game with a total of 61. Essentially, Elgin Baylor is what you get if Michael Jordan gave Dennis Rodman some of his scoring ability, and for this reason, I have him higher on my list than most people typically do. Number 17, Oscar Robertson. He was one of the most well-rounded offensive threats that the game has ever seen. Everyone talks about his triple-double season in 1962, but what people usually fail to consider is how he averaged a 30-point triple-double over the course of his first six seasons in the NBA. Talk about taking the league by storm. With more championships, he would certainly be much higher on my list. He finally got his first championship in 1971 as a member of the Milwaukee Bucks. And although Oscar was certainly a contributing star, he wasn't the leader of that team, as that was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Regardless, his statistical impact is one that hasn't been matched at the point guard position, which is why it wouldn't be a solid top 20 without him. Number 16, Isaiah Thomas. My life has turned into some kind of a sick joke where now I, of all people, have become one of the biggest defenders of Isaiah's legacy. I hated this guy growing up, as he was the face of the bad boy Pistons. With that being said, I couldn't deny his talent, as Isaiah was one of the greatest dual threats that the game has ever seen, as he could destroy you by dropping 20 assists in a game, and then the next game, he'll destroy you by scoring 40 points. This all-time great ball handler led his Pistons to back-to-back -to -back championships in the late 80s, and if it wasn't for the phantom foul, he probably would have won three straight. He's also one of the most clutch performers of all time, like when he set the NBA Finals record by scoring 25 points in a quarter on a swollen ankle, or like when he dropped 16 points in just 94 seconds of a pivotal NBA playoff game. I watched it, I dreaded it, and I firmly believe that Isaiah was one of the best to ever do it. Number 15, Julius Irving. 
Notice how this video is not titled the 30 greatest NBA players of all time. If it was, I would have to have the doctor much lower on this list. But when you include his ABA accomplishments, he has one of the most impressive careers of all time. Between the two leagues, he has 16 all-star appearances, four league MVPs, and three championship rings. Along with that, he was one of the most dynamic high flyers, and the man was scary in fast break situations, dunking on anyone and everyone who stood in his path. He was also a member of the nearly undefeated 1983 76ers, who some Philly fans still believe is the greatest NBA team of all time. Number 14, Moses Malone. I'm so tired of hearing people's lists of the greatest centers of all time, and somehow he keeps getting omitted from it. Moses wasn't just one of the greatest rebounders in league history, but I believe he was objectively the greatest offensive rebounder of all time, which is a trait you just can't overappreciate, as any team would love to have that many second chance opportunities. He was a pretty darn good scorer too, as he got as high as 31.1 points per game in 1982. For his career as a whole, he won six rebounding titles. He was a three-time league MVP, and he was the finals MVP of the championship winning 1983 76ers. Number 13, Jerry West. Anyone who objectively watches his highlights and pays attention to his skills can see that West was so ahead of his time. Jerry had fantastic mechanics on his jumper and was extremely crafty at getting the shots he wanted. Quite simply, he was one of the greatest scorers and playoff scorers to ever live. The underrated part of his game though was his defensive ability. Jerry was arguably the best pickpocket during his playing days, and he was a remarkably sneaky shot blocker. For his career, he made five all-defense teams, and all of those were in the twilight of his career, simply because the honor did not exist until that point. If they had always been available for him to win, then he might have had more all-defense team selections than any other guard in league history. Add in a championship ring as a member of the 1972 Lakers, which was the team that won 33 straight games, and he certainly deserves a spot in the top 15. Number 12, Steph Curry. On my list, Steph made a bigger jump than any other player, shooting 11 spots up the list. Since that initial ranking, he's become the all-time leader in three-pointers made. He's won a fourth NBA championship ring, and he secured his first finals MVP. But let's be real, it really should have been a second. Along with that, Steph has one of the greatest single seasons on any resume, as we witnessed his legendary 2016 unanimous MVP season, where he had the highest scoring 50-40-90 season in league history. Some people want to move him into the top 10, but I think that's a little too much, considering how Steph is not an elite defensive player, and is kind of just a one-way player. Sure, he's not horrible on defense, but he's certainly not one of the best at the position. Based on my list, he's either the second or the third greatest one-way player of all time. So with that in mind, the 12th spot is certainly nothing to scoff at. Number 11, Shaquille O'Neal. This was one of the more controversial spots on my previous list, but I'm sticking to it. Now I understand, Shaq had one of the top three greatest peaks that I've ever seen. But that's the thing, we have to emphasize his peak, because Shaq didn't maintain his elite form as well as just about every other player in the top 10. This shouldn't be a debated point either, considering how Shaq's bad conditioning is something he personally admitted to in a public conversation with Kobe Bryant. With that being said, Shaq is as close to being in the top 10 as you can be without making it. And he won four championship rings and three finals MVPs. He should have been the first unanimous MVP winner in 2000, but one smooth-brained voter went with Allen Iverson instead. Number 10, Hakeem Olajuwon. He has the fewest championship rings of any player in my top 12, but I don't believe that's any fault of his own, as the dream was devoid of superstar talent help throughout the prime years of his career. Sure, he had Ralph Sampson very early on, but it didn't take long for Sampson's back issues to ruin that. Of players who won back-to-back -back championships, Hakeem Olajuwon was the only player to do it while not having a single all-star teammate. 
He was a beast in many aspects as he not only has a quadruple double on his resume, but he nearly had two in the same month. He's one of the top three greatest defensive players in league history, and he was often among the league leaders in scoring as well, which very few players can claim. The dream was so good that he was selected before Michael Jordan, yet no one in Houston even regrets it. Number 9. Tim Duncan The big fundamental was the model of consistency in the game of basketball, as he earned himself 15 All-Defense teams and won 5 NBA championships over the span of 16 years. His 2003 postseason was one of the most dominant playoff stretches, as he historically crushed the New Jersey Nets, nearly getting the only quadruple double in NBA playoff history. Thanks to a talented supporting cast, Duncan was able to compete for championships long after his prime days were behind him, which is why I don't have him ranked as high as some others might. Still, Duncan certainly deserves a spot in the top 10. Number 8. Kobe Bryant I moved the Mamba up a spot since my last list, as I figured I had him a bit too low. In terms of his peak, I believe Kobe has a solid argument for a spot in the top 5. But when you look at his career as a whole, it's not quite as glamorous. Kobe took a while to get going in his career, as his first few seasons saw limited production and limited minutes. And his final few seasons in the NBA were straight up ugly, as he was rotating between major injuries while shooting 35% from the field on nearly 20 shots per game. Still, how great were those glory days? At his peak, Kobe was scoring 35 points per game while being first team all defense, which is something only Michael Jordan has basically done as well. Kobe won 5 championships and his last one doesn't feel appreciated enough, as Kobe led his Lakers to defeat the stacked Boston Celtics while he had a broken index finger on his shooting hand. What other great has a claim like that? Number 7. Magic Johnson Almost the entirety of his career, Magic was competing for NBA championships. In my opinion, he has the best single playoff performance of all time, as he dropped this stat line in Game 6 of the 1980 Finals, which he did as a rookie while filling in for an injured Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at center. Magic was the embodiment of playing the game the right way, as he specialized in making his teammates better. For his career, he won 5 NBA championships, he was the finals MVP 3 times, and he won 3 league MVPs. Magic also made 9 trips to the NBA finals before his first retirement, and for perspective, Magic only played 12 seasons before that first retirement. Some have him ranked even higher than I do, but for me personally, a lack of solid defensive prowess is what limits his ranking. Number 6. Larry Bird I know, it's a hot take to have him ranked over Magic, but the thing about Larry Bird is that he was competing in the much tougher Eastern Conference, as the East was a bloodbath in the 1980s. Along with that, I just believe Bird was the more impressive player from an individual perspective, as he had no holes in his game. He was a lethal scorer, he was an elite rebounder, he was an all-time great passer, and he was an extremely underrated defensive player, which is a topic I've made entire videos about. At one point, Bird had 50-40-90 percentages while averaging close to 30 points per game over a 5-year stretch, which quite simply is one of the greatest individual achievements of all time. If it wasn't for his back injuries cutting his career very short, then Bird may have been able to build a career strong enough to consider him in the top three. Number 5. Bill Russell Let me just say this plainly. If Bill Russell was an efficient league-leading scorer, he'd easily be my choice as the greatest player of all time. It's kind of astonishing that I'm putting him this high on my list, considering how he was severely limited offensively. Now with that being said, Russell always claimed that he did the things that actually won basketball games, and who am I to argue with him? In his career, Russell won 11 championship rings, including a ridiculous 8 straight. Along with that, he was 10-0 in series deciding 7th games, and he always played well in those instances. To this day, many people believe he's the GOAT defensive player, and if the Defensive Player of the Year award had existed, he would have been collecting them like Infinity Stones. 
At the end of the day, it's all about winning, and anyone could call him their GOAT, and they'd get no arguments from me. Number 4. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar When it comes to the all-time statistics, Kareem has got an argument as good as anyone's for the top spot. What's crazy is that Kareem is second all-time in scoring, and if blocks had been calculated in his first few seasons in the league, he would probably be the all-time leader in block shots as well. If players like Kevin Durant get a boost for being difficult to guard, then so should Kareem, who had the most indefensible shot ever, his patented skyhook. The only thing drawing him back is the fact that he was not the best player in over half of his championship teams. Regardless, he earned 15 All-NBA teams, 11 All-Defense teams, and a whopping 6 League MVPs. So he's certainly worthy of being at least in the 4th spot. Number 3. Will Chamberlain Everyone thinks I'm crazy, and that's fine because I'm not pumping the brakes on this so-called crazy train. To me, Will Chamberlain is far greater than people usually give him credit for. Stop and think about what an average of 50 points and 25 rebounds looks like on a nightly basis. I don't think people actually take the time to fathom that. Wilt broke so many records throughout his career that they just started calling him the record book. People try to belittle his accomplishments and make sense of it by saying that he played against weaker competition. But when you consider that Wilt played against Bill Russell, Walt Bellamy, and Nate Thurman each around 12 to 16 times per season, then you start to realize just how impressive his accomplishments were. Honestly, I could elaborate on Wilt's ranking endlessly, but if you've seen any of my Wilt videos before, you get it. Number 2. LeBron James A couple years ago, I had LeBron fans all up in their feelings when I ranked him 4th on my list. Honestly, that was less about a negative view of LeBron and more about my positive views of Kareem and Wilt. At this point though, LeBron has built up such a body of work that he has to be at least in the second spot. He's earned an absurd 19 All-Star selections. He's won 4 NBA championships, 4 Finals MVPs, and 4 League MVPs. He's now the NBA's all-time leading scorer, the all-time leading playoff scorer, and he's up to the fourth spot on the NBA's all-time assists list. Honestly, there is an argument for LeBron to take the number one spot, and I truly believe that. But that argument would have to focus on the complete body of work of his NBA career so far, which is only becoming more impressive the longer he plays. For me, peak performance is what's most important though, which takes us to our number one spot. Number one, Michael Jordan. Six championships in eight years. He earned nine first team all defense selections and he won the scoring title in all of those seasons as well. Not only was Jordan 6-0 in the NBA finals, but he was constantly breaking records in those finals. A lot of Gen Z LeBron fans want to discredit Jordan's competition and try to belittle his dominance over the league. But here's the thing. The only reason you're able to belittle Jordan's competition is because MJ dominated the league in the first place. Let's take Karl Malone for example. If Michael Jordan never existed, Karl Malone would have had three league MVPs instead of two. He would have had five scoring titles instead of zero, and he would have won two championships instead of zero. Without MJ as an obstacle, Malone is rivaling Tim Duncan for the title of the greatest power forward of all time. But because Jordan existed, he's treated like an afterthought, as his legacy is completely different. That's the effect MJ had on the league, as he kept Malone, Stockton, Barkley, Ewing, Kemp, Penny, Miller, and many others from ever winning an NBA championship. This is just one of the many reasons why he's still my choice as the greatest player of all time. So as I'm starting this video, I want to be completely honest with you guys about my thought process. All this video is, is a giant opinion piece based on my own personal experiences. And I feel like no matter how I rank this list, people are going to be ridiculing me for it. If I say that the 2010s are the best, people are going to say that I'm biased just because I'm young. If I say the 2000s are the best, people are going to say it's only because I'm a millennial. If I say the 90s are the best, people are going to say it's because I'm a secret Jordan stan. If I say the 80s are the best, people will say it's because I run an old head channel. 
And if I say that the 70s are the best, people will just say that I must have a coke addiction. Simply put, this is the kind of list where there's no winning regardless of how I rank it. There is no objectively correct answer when it comes to this, but these are just my opinions based off my own personal preferences. So let's make this a fun activity, and please, let me know your personal opinions and your personal preferences in the comment section below. One major piece of clarification before I continue. I am not ranking this list purely based on the talent and the quality of the players, but rather I'm ranking this list based on the NBA product as a whole, like how good the players were, how diverse were the styles, how entertaining were the broadcasts, how passionate was the competition, and so on. In my most simple way of phrasing it, this is my ranked list based on how enjoyable each decade was, from the least enjoyable to the most enjoyable. Make sense? Awesome. Without further ado, let's get into it. First off is number 7. The worst decade of NBA basketball is the 1950s. I feel like this is the first choice for obvious reasons. The game was just so archaic at this point that many of the fundamentals were still being developed at this point. Many players didn't even have a jump shot in their arsenal and remained completely flat-footed while shooting perimeter shots. Going back and watching some of those older games are really tough at times, as field goal percentages were significantly lower league-wide, and the ball handling skills were so far from what they are today, generally speaking. In many ways, you still had the color barrier affecting the level of talent within the league, and without the game being widely known to European players, the game was severely lacking global competition as well. I'm not saying it was all bad, you still had beautiful passers and ball handlers like Bob Cousy, and you still had skilled big men like George Mikan, with his incredible ambidextrous hook shots. But regardless, when you look at the bigger picture, this decade just hasn't aged as well as many of the others on this list. Number 6, the 1970s. Although this decade was significantly more talented than the 1950s, the 70s was still the decade that put pro basketball on life support and nearly crashed the brand entirely. Without any back-to-back -back champions, there was a real lack of identity within this era, and is often referred to as the decade of parody. But although that was a significant issue, that was far from basketball's greatest problem in the 1970s. In those years, both the NBA and the NBA had significant issues with drug abuse, and on-court violence was a pretty regular occurrence as well. What does keep it out of contention for the worst spot on the list is the fact that that era was still immensely talented, with guys like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Julius Irving, John Havlicek, Pistol Pete Maravich, and so on. Don't get me wrong, it still had some areas of appeal, and I probably still would have been a basketball fan if I was alive in the 1970s. But compared to the decades ahead of it, it left a lot to be desired. Number 5, the 1960s. Obviously, basketball did not have the same level of popularity during this era, and it wasn't close to having the same level of accessibility for the average basketball fan because there was fewer teams, meaning fewer cities had pro basketball to watch. And frankly, most NBA games were not even caught on film. The top 25 greatest performances of Wilt Chamberlain's career, we don't even have any footage of, which tells you just how limited that era was as a basketball fan. Then you have to consider the fact that free agency didn't exist yet in the NBA, meaning that once a player was drafted, that player was owned by that franchise forever, or at least as long as they wanted him. But if you're winning with these players, why would you feel inclined to trade them at any point? This is why a team like the Boston Celtics was able to win 8 straight championships. Because they were good, and they stayed good, and no one else could do anything about it. With that being said, there are some incredible things about this era that puts it ahead of the 50s and 70s. For example, the rivalry between Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain was truly awe-inspiring to all who witnessed it. These two were some of the most incredible athletes in sports history, and they just so happened to be playing in the same era as competitors. 
Then you add in the other talented greats, like Jerry West, Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, Bob Pettit, and Nate Thurmond, and so on. And then concentrate all of that talent to 9 or 10 teams in the league, and you have one truly competitive sport. It definitely had some major drawbacks, but there were several aspects that made it very special as well. Number 4. The 2010s Some young basketball fans are going to be furious at me for ranking this decade this low, but honestly, it has nothing to do with the level of talent of this era, but rather, it has more to do with how the league was ran, and that blame falls on the commissioner and the general managers. During the 2010s, flopping was out of control. Load management truly got its start in this decade, and due to the shorter contracts, player movement became so frequent that it's become rather difficult for fan bases to be emotionally invested in their superstar players like they were in years past. Because although you may buy his jersey, and although you may have a poster of your favorite player on your bedroom wall, by the time summer rolls around, he may be forcing a trade or exercising a player option in order to head to another city. Another reason I wasn't terribly fond of this era as much as others is because there was a lot of instances where super teams made the playoff experience less interesting. When LeBron James joined the Miami Heat, forming a super team consisting of three top 10 players, he was so confident in the strength of that squad that he predicted a minimum of eight championships. Now I get it. His comments were a bit tongue-in-cheek. But still, you don't make that joke unless you know you're a championship contender night in and night out. At one stretch, the Cavaliers and the Warriors met in the NBA Finals for four straight seasons, and it got to a point that it was so predictable that it made all of the playoffs leading up to that championship series pretty boring as a result. Now with all this being said, there are still many amazing moments from this decade. The 3-1 comeback by LeBron and the Cavaliers is something that we will never forget. The rise of Steph Curry and his 3-point shooting was truly incredible to witness, and it was a monumental and course-shifting moment of basketball history. Add in the beautiful basketball of the San Antonio Spurs, add in Kobe's farewell game, and add in all the great MVP races of that era, and there's truly a lot of great takeaways. But overall, I feel like this more recent decade was very lacking as far as how the product was presented to the fans, which is why it's just outside my top three. Number three, the 1980s. Some of the aspects of this era can either be a positive or a negative, all depending on who you ask. This era was insanely physical as the flagrant foul rule was not fully enforced yet in the NBA. So because of this, some teams would implement an unwritten no layup rule, where if an offensive player attacked the basket, the defender had full authorization to hit him and put him on his butt, which would make him think twice about attacking the basket again. This gladiatorial style to the game of basketball might be seen as highly entertaining to some, but just wait until that style results in an injury to one of your favorite players. If I'm being completely honest, I think the hard fouls of the 1980s have been very romanticized as time has gone on, because I remember watching countless VHS tapes of that era, and back then, no one outside of Detroit had any love for the Bad Boy Pistons' physically punishing style of basketball. Now one of the major pros of that era was the fact that there was a lot of unselfish team first leaders like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Isaiah Thomas who led their teams to be championship contenders while having beautiful ball movement where seemingly everyone got involved. The general style of that era was extremely fast, as many of the best teams in the league were in love with transition plays, which I personally always thought was extremely exciting. Another plus of this era was the fact that it bolstered the greatest rivalry in basketball history between Bird Celtics and Magic's Lakers. This dynamic rivalry captivated the American audience, and essentially saved a struggling NBA from imploding. With that being said, the balance of power was somewhat off, as the Eastern Conference was way more loaded than the West, which is why Los Angeles was representing the West in the finals nearly every year of that decade. 
Although the styles of basketball were highly entertaining, there still wasn't quite enough three-point shooting for my liking, as the league was still adjusting to the three-point shot being implemented in 1979. Ultimately, it's a decade that's still near and dear to my heart, but there's just a few too many drawbacks to keep it from being in one of the top two spots. Number two, the 1990s. A lot of people are going to be mad at me for this one because many fans view the 1990s as the golden age of basketball and especially a lot of people who watch my videos. And from a certain standpoint, I get it. It had the player who most people believe is the greatest of all time. The NBA on NBC broadcasts were absolutely incredible. And from the perspective of NBA Finals viewership, it's never been higher than it was during that decade. With that being said, I do think there were a couple negatives that kept it from being in my number one spot. For one, the league was really trying to figure out its style during this decade. In the early 90s, there was much more scoring and much more transition basketball. But as the decade progressed, the game slowed down dramatically due to some rule changes and due to the elite players at the time. General scoring had gotten so low that the league office became concerned and even temporarily shortened the three-point line for a couple of seasons as a way to compensate for that lower scoring. If you've never seen a full game from the 1997 or the 1998 NBA Finals, then I would encourage you to do so. It is literally stunning how much slower the pace of play was during that era. And to the casual basketball fan, there were points that it might even lull them to sleep. As awesome as I believe the 90s were, it is a bit of an acquired taste. One of the most amazing things that it had working in its favor was all the diverse styles throughout the league. You had powerfully dominant centers and power forwards. Then you had skillful bigs who relied more on their finesse. You had athletically gifted slashers and mid-range artists. But you also had superstars who operated mostly as three-point specialists. In that era, every star felt like a unique character of their own. And they were not all shoehorned into playing with a similar style and approach, like many modern stars are in the 2020s. If you believe the 90s are the gold standard of basketball, then I can't knock you for it. But for me, there's just a few things it could have done better, which brings me to my favorite decade. Number one, the 2000s. To a certain extent, the league was in panic mode, trying to figure out how it was going to live its life after Michael Jordan retired. To the extent that several young stars were now being called the next Michael Jordan prematurely by the media. The thing is, they shouldn't have worried about it as much as they did, because the league was in extremely good hands. Stars like Shaq, Allen Iverson, Kobe Bryant, Vince Carter, Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan, LeBron James, Tracy McGrady, and Dirk Nowitzki made for a highly entertaining and extremely competitive league. And just about every fan had someone they could root for and relate to. To me, the 2000s were the perfect blend of all the various extremes from the other eras. The game was physical enough to make you feel like grown men were intensely battling at what they do best. But it also wasn't so barbaric that it made you worry about the safety of your favorite player every other night. The game had an inside presence, but it wasn't just that. The game had a mid-range presence, but it wasn't just that either. The game had three-point shooting, but it wasn't too much. The talent of the league was dispersed evenly enough that every season was interesting and surprising. There was also plenty of superstars who took pride in being fierce competitors, and who also took pride in showing up for work every day when they were capable of doing so. If you ask me, this decade was generally the most well-balanced era of all time, which made for an extremely intriguing product from beginning to the end. But if there's one thing that making this list has taught me, it's that we've never had a perfect decade in NBA history. Because even though the 2000s are my favorite, it still had its own shortcomings as well. Like the malice of the palace and how that began softening the league. Or like the numerous controversies related to the 2002 playoffs and the 2006 NBA finals. At the end of the day, it looks like we're still looking for that perfect decade of NBA basketball. Today's video is a ranked list on something I've never seen ranked before. 
We're looking at the top five players in NBA history with the greatest footwork. Clearly, this is going to be a completely subjective list based on my own experiences and based on my observations through the eye test. So with that being said, I imagine many of us will have very different looking lists. So let me know in the comments how your list differs from mine. So without further ado, let's get into it. Number 5. Dirk Nowitzki This 7-foot sniper is most famous for being a Dallas legend, for his iconic jumper, and for beating the Super Team Miami Heat in the 2011 NBA Finals. But unfortunately, one of the most severely underrated aspects of his game was his all-time great footwork. Not enough is said about his skills in the post, as he would consistently pirouette on either foot to give himself the best angles for scoring. Sure, his tremendous size and his soft shooting touch helped him become the legend that he is today. But without his tremendous discipline and without his fundamental footwork, he wouldn't have been half of the player that he was. Number 4. Michael Jordan You just knew the most iconic basketball player in NBA history had to be on here. In his youth, Michael studied the elite footwork of the great David Thompson, and then applied it to his game and quite nearly perfected it. It's easy to look at MJ's career and just assume that he built his legacy on his tremendous speed and leaping ability. But beyond that, MJ was an absolute artist at getting to efficient spots for scoring, using his sound and methodical footwork, especially during the three years of the second three-peat. There was almost nothing that MJ couldn't do with his feet, as he had one of the quickest first steps of all time. He had an insane stutter step to throw off the defender, and he could constantly hit jumpers fading in any direction, which worked quite well with his frequent pirouetting on each foot. Number 3. Kevin McHale You know you're great with basketball footwork when you're given the nickname the Torture Chamber because of how you dominate defenders in the low post. During the 1980s, McHale was frequently in the discussion for the title of the greatest power forward of all time, and he earned that legacy with his tremendously skillful feet and with his high offensive IQ. You see, McHill wasn't like other great power forwards like Charles Barkley, Carl Malone, or Sean Kemp, in the sense that he wasn't really all that fast, strong, or particularly athletic. He was simply crafty, intelligent, and disciplined on offense, as he used those advantages to score at will. He shot better than 60% from the field during his prime while being one of the game's top scorers. Unfortunately, his all-time great footwork never quite gets the shine that it deserves, and that's because of another all-time great big man. But I'll elaborate more on that in a bit. Number 2. Kobe Bryant In the way that Michael Jordan learned his footwork from David Thompson, Kobe Bryant studied the footwork of Michael Jordan. And this might sound controversial to some, but yes, I think he improved upon it. In my opinion, we've never seen better footwork from a guard as he could make killer moves cleanly in transition. He could have defenders confused as to which way he was going in the post. And thanks to his tremendous ability to score with his left hand, he was often just as deadly pirouetting to his left. All you have to do is watch highlights of Kobe confusing and abusing some of the best wing defenders of his era. In my experience, I've only seen one who was better and I think even Kobe would have agreed, seeing as he went to him for his teaching. Number 1. Hakeem Olajuwon The Dream is one of my most favorite and one of the most fascinating players in NBA history. As incredible as he was defensively, he was arguably just as good offensively. His iconic Dream Shake was his go-to post move that had opposing defenders crying for mercy. Now you can't truly appreciate that fact until you understand the era that he played in, as Hakeem went up against some of the greatest centers and some of the greatest defenders of all time, and even they looked completely helpless to stop him. Opposing centers like Shaquille O'Neal, Patrick Ewing, Alonzo Mourning, Dikembe Mutombo, and of course David Robinson. He was so good at this aspect of his game that he's essentially built a career after his NBA career by teaching active players how to replicate his moves. 
players like Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Dwight Howard, and Giannis have all sought the counsel from this master of footwork. Why? Because he's simply the go at it. Here's my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these players have made the list instead? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Today's topic is one that I'm sure is going to have many people in their feelings. Just who are the top 10 greatest passers in NBA history? Well, I can't provide you with an objectively correct list, but I can give you my list based on my knowledge of NBA history and based on the criterias on which I'm ranking the list. So let's get into them. The first category is facilitating that leads to winning. Because if it's not helping you be successful, then literally, what's the point? Second is the player's assist per game average, both in terms of their peaks and over the course of their careers. Third is their assist to turnover ratio, because getting a lot of assists isn't simply the best outcome if the player was incredibly sloppy with the basketball while doing it. Fourth is court vision and execution. How good was the player's ability to find the open man on the court and deliver him the ball with accuracy in a timely fashion? And the fifth and final category is longevity. It's one thing to be one of the best facilitators in the game for some time, but it's another level entirely to be able to do it for an entire era or two. So now that you guys see the logic, let's get into it. Number 10, Oscar Robertson. He wasn't necessarily the most flashy or highlight-worthy distributor, as Oscar leaned more on his fundamental disciplines while being one of the most effective floor generals in the game. Obviously, the fact that he played in the 1960s probably doesn't help his case much either, seeing how most of his dimes weren't even caught on film. With that being said, there's no question that the Big O was the most dominant giver of his era as he led the NBA in assists per game a whopping seven times in his career, and had an amazing career average of 9.5 per game. Unfortunately, the NBA did not track turnovers for individual players until the start of the 77-78 season, which naturally means that we can't gauge how clean his assist to turnover ratio was. But based on his reputation from his peers in that era, we can at least make the assumption that it's pretty solid. As impressive as he was, he had some natural limitations of his era working against him, so he'll have to settle for the 10th spot on this list. Number 9. Bob Cousy Back when this man played, and back when his Celtics dominated the league, he was seen as an absolute savant with the basketball, which was why he was properly given the nickname the Houdini of the hardwood. Although he never once averaged at least 10 assists per game in a season, that was more of a product of his era, as what constituted an assist was a bit more specific at that time. Regardless, he led the NBA in assists per game a whopping 8 seasons straight, getting as high as 9.5 per game in 1960. He was certainly a much flashier passer than Oscar Robertson, but in a way that's similar to the Big O, he has the limitations of his era working against him, like the lack of certain statistics and the lack of available footage. And because of this, I have a difficult time ranking him any higher than this spot on my list. Number 8. Nikola Jokic What's amazing is that this guy is still in his 20s, yet he's already this high on my list. The Joker's ability to find his open teammates and deliver them the rock with extreme precision is rivaled by very few. At this point, he's easily the greatest passing center that I've ever seen. And the fact that he's nearly been able to average as high as 10 assists per game in a season while not being the player consistently bringing the ball up the court is truly remarkable to say the least. In my opinion, that aspect elevates him quite a few spots when determining the rankings. There's almost no type of pass that the Joker can't make, as he has the strength and precision to be an all-time great outlet passer. He's an amazing lob passer, and he is absolutely remarkable at facilitating from the post, as his court awareness and his high offensive IQ makes it often appear as if he's got eyes in the back of his head. Number 7. Isaiah Thomas he was the leader of the bad boy Detroit Pistons who won back-to-back -back championships in 1989 and 1990, 
and he did it as an intimidating dual threat, who could score and distribute at will. The passing aspect is usually one of the more underappreciated aspects of his game, and if it wasn't for John Stockton, he would have the highest single season assist per game average in NBA history when he had 13.9 in the 84 to 85 season. Without his incredible playmaking ability, the Pistons wouldn't have been perennial contenders in the Eastern Conference. Some of his incredible passing was overshadowed by the fact that he played in the same era as Magic Johnson. But make no mistake, Isaiah was elite at making quick, split-second decisions with his facilitating. Number 6. LeBron James What players like the Joker lack in longevity, LeBron has several times over. He's only led the NBA in assists per game once in his 21-year career, but by the time his career is done, he may be as high as second all-time on the NBA's total assists list. LeBron has the offensive IQ and the court awareness to find the open shooter as soon as they have a second of daylight. The vast majority of his career has been as a forward, but that hasn't stopped James from usually operating as the team's floor general. Personally, I don't see LeBron as a past first player, like many of his fans like to claim. Because although he gets plenty of assists, he's still usually among the league leaders in shots attempted per game. But you could argue that that makes his assist numbers even more impressive. Considering how he could be routinely competing for the assist title, if he was just a little less aggressive when it comes to his own scoring. It's a unique case, but without a doubt, it's worthy of a spot. Number 5. Chris Paul Simply put, CP3 has one of the highest offensive IQs in the history of the NBA, as his elite playmaking have contributed to his teams being frequent playoff competitors. He's led the NBA in assists per game five separate times in his career, getting as high as 11.6 in 2008. On top of that, he's extremely careful with the basketball as he's only had one season in his entire career where he's averaged at least three turnovers per game. In all of the other 18 seasons of his career, he's never once averaged more than 2.6 turnovers per game. This astounding longevity and consistency has given him a top three spot on the NBA's all-time assists list. One thing that's rarely mentioned is how this point guard has elevated other players to their peak while they were his teammate. Players like David West, Tyson Chandler, and DeAndre Jordan all experienced their best seasons while Chris Paul was feeding them. Number 4. Steve Nash He's a two-time MVP winner and he was the leader of the famous 7-second offense that focused heavily on transition basketball, split decision making, and perimeter shooting. During his prime, he was the standard of a floor raiser and the ultimate example of a guy who makes his teammates better. With the Phoenix Suns, Nash led the NBA in assists per game on five separate occasions, getting as high as 11.6 in 2007. This was also a time when the NBA was averaging less points league-wide. One can only imagine the kind of facilitating numbers he would average today if he played in this modern era. Even during times of chronic back pain, Nash remained among the league leaders in assists per game, and his impact on the game is still felt to this very day, as his fast pace and perimeter-focused approach has now become the standard in this modern league. Number 3. Jason Kidd This 6'4 point guard was utterly mesmerizing with the basketball, as he could make specific passes with a perfect amount of spin that it would make your jaw hit the floor. He was incredible in transition and was one of the most precise and accurate law passers in the history of basketball. He was regularly averaging high assist numbers during the lowest scoring era of modern history. In total, he led the NBA in assists per game four times, getting as high as 10.8 in 1999. He was the engine that drove the New Jersey Nets offense. And thanks to his solid leadership and tremendous playmaking, he was able to lead the Nets to the NBA Finals twice in the 2000s. If the fate of the universe is on the line, and I have to make the most accurate pass that I can possibly make, then Jason Kidd just might be my choice. Number 2. John Stockton 
To this day, this guy is still the NBA's all-time leader in total assists. And frankly, it's not even close, as he has a lead over second place that's equivalent to five seasons worth of leading the NBA in assists. He was never the most flashy or a highlight-worthy passer, as he loved to run the pick and roll with Karl Malone throughout the late 80s and 1990s. He wouldn't often make your jaw hit the floor with his routine yet intelligent passes, but no one could argue against its effectiveness, as Stockton led the NBA in assists per game for nine straight seasons, from 1988 to 1996. Out of the six seasons with the highest assists per game average in NBA history, John Stockton has five of them, which is utterly insane. One of the common narratives that you hear today is that he didn't have a left hand, and to that I say, damn. He was really just that much better than almost everyone else with only his right. Before I get into the number one spot, here is my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these players have made the list instead? Let me know below. Number one, Magic Johnson. I can't imagine you guys being all that surprised. This man was the face of the Showtime Lakers high octane offense in the 1980s. And in the history of basketball, no other point guards facilitating has led to as much winning. He led the NBA in assists per game in four separate seasons, and to this day, he still has the highest career average in NBA history, at an amazing 11.2. You won't find a better example of a guy who made his teammates better than Magic Johnson. Sure, he had plenty of Hall of Fame talent, like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and James Worthy, but even in the few instances where he didn't have the talent to support him, Magic was historically great. Like in his rookie season in Game 6 of the 1980 Finals, where he won the game with his remarkable playmaking even without Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the lineup. Or how about the 1991 Finals, where his two best scoring options, Byron Scott and James Worthy, were both out with an injury. Yet Magic still finished Game 5 with 20 assists which no other player has done before in NBA Finals history. Speaking of which, of the top five games in Finals history with the most assists, Magic Johnson has all five of them. He had the averages, he had the precision, he had the vision, and he had the numbers. The only thing he really didn't have was longevity, which is fortunate for everyone else, because in that hypothetical scenario, it wouldn't have been even close. Very few sequences that happen in the NBA are completely brand new. At this point in time, the NBA is so deep and rich in its history that many incredible things have already happened time and time again. But this video is about the very few exceptions. Today, we're looking at the top 5 one-of-a-kind plays of all time. Sure, certain plays are rare and impressive, like Larry Bird's over-the-backboard shot. But even though we can acknowledge that it's rare, it's still been done several times throughout history. Kobe Bryant's done it, LeBron James has done it, Drew Holiday has done it, and even freaking Clint Capella has done it too. In order to make this list, it can't just be a rare occurrence, but it has to be the only time it has ever taken place. Obviously, I'm just a basketball fan with a very finite understanding of the game's history. So if I mention a specific play, and something has happened that's very similar to that play, then feel free to point it out in the comment section below, and I'll educate myself on the matter. So without further ado, let's get into it. Number 5. Kobe Bryant's Left-Handed 3 Now I will admit, this first spot on the list is a bit shaky, because it's very likely that some other player has done this before, but I'm just not aware of it. Essentially, Kobe hit one of the most ridiculously difficult shots of all time, which occurred in 2005 in a regular season matchup against the Dallas Mavericks. Basically, Kobe was trapped in the corner, with the shot clock winding down and he had very few options. So a desperate Mamba fired a spinning three-point shot with his non-dominant hand and buried it. To this day, I can't recall another player hitting a three-point shot with his non-dominant hand. Although, Steph Curry was extremely close when he made this and one play in 2021 against the Boston Celtics. It was initially credited as a three, but the replay revealed that Steph's foot was on the line, 
making Kobe to this day the only player I've ever seen do it. Number 4. Rodney Rogers 9 points in 9 seconds One could argue that this is more of a sequence than a play, but regardless, I thought it would be cool to include on this list. Reggie Miller is famous for the time in the playoffs where he made a 3-point shot, stole the ball, and then made another 3-point shot to keep his Pacers in that playoff game. But in 1994, Rodney Rogers did him one better, and very few people know about it. It was a regular season matchup against the Utah Jazz, and late in the fourth quarter, the Denver Nuggets find themselves trailing by 8 points. That's when Rodney Rogers and Robert Pack go on an insane run, where they continuously steal the ball, and Rogers buries three separate three-point field goals in just the span of nine seconds, which gave his Nuggets the one-point lead. The excitement of the moment was quickly extinguished though, as the Jazz went on to make the game-winning jumper on the very next play. Despite the letdown, I'm pretty sure Rodgers can claim that he's the only player to make up an 8-point deficit in just 9 seconds. Number 3. The Trailblazers 8-Point Play On February 13th, 2019, the Golden State Warriors and the Portland Trailblazers were in a regular season matchup. With less than 4 minutes left in the 4th quarter, the Blazers had the lead, and the game was still within striking distance for Golden State. This is when Portland's big man, Zach Collins, attacks the basket, and gets pummeled by Draymond Green. The refs decided that this was a flagrant foul on Green, so the Blazers were awarded two free throws. The head coach Steve Kerr doesn't like it, and proceeded to absolutely lose his mind, resulting in him getting two technical fouls and being ejected from the game. Then, things really started to spiral for the Warriors, when Draymond started complaining to the referee, and gets hit with a technical foul. Now the Blazers are awarded their 4th and 5th technical free throws. Now remember, this is all over the course of one single possession. Portland maintains possession, inbounds the ball, and the Blazers' Jake Lehman hits a dagger 3-point shot, making this an unprecedented 8-point play for Portland. Within the span of just a few seconds of the game's clock, the game went from being within striking distance to a complete and utter blowout. Number 2. J.R. Ryder's Play of the Decade On December 22, 1994, the 5-18 Minnesota Timberwolves were up against the 12-10 Sacramento Kings. There was nothing particularly special about this matchup, as neither of these squads would go on to make the playoffs. On this bad Timberwolves team was a player named Isaiah Ryder, who had just won the NBA's dunk contest earlier that year with his iconic East Bay dunk. But this night's incredible moment wouldn't be thanks to his tremendous leaping ability, but instead it was thanks to an unreal circus shot, and a tremendous amount of luck. His teammate, Winston Garland, threw a horrible pass that required Ryder to save the ball from going out of bounds, and what ensued was possibly the most unbelievable three-point basket in NBA history, which the game's commentators quickly declared as the play of the decade. For as long as I live, I doubt I'll ever see a shot as lucky as this one. Number 1. Vince Carter's Dunk of Death it's one thing to jump clear over a defender while scoring a basket. Giannis has done that, LeBron James has done that, and even Bill Russell did that back in the 60s. But usually, they were clearing players around 6 feet tall. It's another thing entirely to completely clear a 7 foot 2 inch center on your way to a thunderous slam. That is what Vince Carter did against France in the 2000 Summer Olympics, as he absolutely immortalized the Frenchman Frederick Weiss, for all the wrong reasons. When it comes to professional American basketball, none of us have ever seen anything quite like this in the heat of regular competition, and that's why I knew this was getting the number one spot the instant I decided the topic of today's video. Here's my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these specific plays have made the top 5 instead? Are there any specific plays that I forgot to include on the honorable mentions list? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below.
So before I get into the list of the top 10 scores in NBA history, let me first mention that there are major categories and minor categories that I will be factoring in. The major categories are peak points per game, playoff scoring, consistency and longevity, efficiency splits, and their scoring relative to the era they played in. The minor categories are their arsenal slash variety of scoring, their scoring titles, their explosiveness, and their clutch scoring. So now that you guys see the logic, let's get into it. Number 10, James Harden. There was once upon a time where I believed this guy would have been one of the top five scorers on my list. But the thing is, he hasn't always been the most consistent score, as different rule changes and different team situations have greatly affected his level of production. He has an insane five season peak where he was consistently a top three scorer, and where he could seemingly score at will. But outside of that, his seasonal numbers are usually pretty pedestrian compared to the rest of the guys on this list. He had three straight scoring titles and got as high as 36.1 points per game in 2019. Now Harden doesn't always have a solid field goal percentage, but he is a dangerous three-point shooter and foul shooter. With his ability to handle the basketball well, and with his ability to get to the free throw line consistently, I believe he's worthy of a top 10 spot. Some will think I'm crazy for not having him any higher than 10th, but beyond his lack of consistency is his usual decline in the playoff atmosphere. His career averages in the playoffs drop from the regular season, including his scoring average, field goal percentage, and three point percentage. If we were looking at only his playoff production, he wouldn't be anywhere near the top 10. But when you look at his career as a whole, I think he barely earns a spot ahead of some other greats. Number 9. Steph Curry Consistency hasn't always been on Steph's side either, as he was a bit of a late bloomer when it comes to his scoring. He didn't average at least 25 points per game in a single season until he was 27 years old. But when things finally got going for him, they got going in a major way. He led the NBA in points per game twice, getting as high as 32 points per game in 2021. He's also one of the most efficient scorers in NBA history, as he's strong from the field and absolutely lethal from three-point range and from the free throw line. Some people act like Steph is just a three-point shooter, but he's truly so much more than just that as he's one of the best ball handlers that the game has ever seen, and he's a remarkable finisher around the rim. He may not be the most consistent or explosive scorer, but the perimeter lethality and insane efficiency is what secures his spot on this list. Number 8. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar For what the previous players lacked in consistency, Kareem had that and some, as he was the NBA's all-time leading scorer for quite a while thanks to his remarkable longevity. Now he was certainly not the most versatile scorer, as he never had a three-point shot, and he was only a decent free throw shooter. But what he did have was the most indefensible shot of all time, the skyhook. This was the bread and butter of his Hall of Fame career, and it made him a reliable low post option throughout. He was never the most explosive scorer, as he never once scored more than 55 points in a single game. But at the very least, he was a sure 25 points per game throughout the vast majority of his playing days. Number 7. LeBron James He's now the NBA's all-time leading scorer, and the first player to ever reach 40,000 points. Without a doubt, his longevity and consistency secures a spot on this list. Now LeBron was never the most explosive scorer, as he only led the league in scoring once in his 21-year career and he's only reached 60 one time. Furthermore, he's far below a league average free throw shooter, which massively hurts his case in the efficiency department. You could also argue that it hurts him in the clutch department since he's been at the free throw line with a game on the line many times in his career. Regardless, the consistency is beyond impressive, as he's in the midst of his 20th straight season averaging at least 25 points per game. To be completely honest, this isn't necessarily the best type of list for LeBron's ranking. If we were looking at the best offensive players in NBA history, then he would certainly be a top 3 player at minimum. 
But as far as pure scoring, he'll have to settle for the seventh spot on my list. Number six, Wilt Chamberlain. Obviously, peak scoring is something that massively boosts his ranking, and Chamberlain is famously the guy who once averaged 50 points in a single season and scored 100 points in a single game. He was also a much more versatile scorer than he's usually given credit for. Beyond his numerous dunks in the painted area, he also had a tremendous finger roll and a dominant fadeaway jumper. He finished his career with a total of seven scoring titles and has the top four spots for the highest single season averages in NBA history. With that being said, it wasn't all positive for Chamberlain as he was a terrible free throw shooter, hitting only 51% of his attempts throughout his career and even got as low as 38% in 1968. Beyond that, his production regularly declined dramatically when the postseason started as he went from a 30 points per game score to a 22 points per game score in the playoffs, while also seeing declines in his field goal percentage and his free throw percentage. At his peak, he was the most jaw-dropping scorer ever, but when you consider the complete body of work, there's some glaring limitations that can't be ignored. Now before I get into the top five, something that's worth mentioning is that each of the players in my top five spots are at least moderately efficient in all three scoring categories, which means field goal percentage, free throw percentage, and three point percentage when it's applicable. For me, that all around efficiency is what makes the difference between a great score and a top five score. Number five, Larry Bird. When it comes to all around efficient scoring, Larry Legend could be seen as the standard to some. He was lethal from the field, from three-point range, and from the free throw line. In fact, Larry had two 50-40-90 seasons in his career, which trails only Steve Nash for the most of all time. And unlike Bird, Nash was never viewed as a primary scorer. Beyond that, Larry actually had a combined five-season stretch where he had 50-40-90 percentages. He was also one of the most clutch bucket getters in league history as he would consistently hit game winners and close out games with his offense. Now what obviously holds him back is the fact that he never once led the league in scoring. With that being said, he was close to 30 points per game several seasons of his career. He wasn't the most explosive scorer, but he was a consistent one as his first and final seasons each saw him averaging north of 20 points per game. He may not be the most likely player to drop 60 points on any given night, but if you need a guy to drop 40 while missing very few shots in the process, then Bird might just be the guy for you. Number four, Jerry West. I have a feeling that this might be one of the most ridiculed selections on my list, but I feel pretty strongly about it. The logo had one of the greatest scoring averages in regular season history, in playoff history, and in finals history. With his elite dribbling skills, with his solid mechanics, and with his tremendous pull-up jumper, he was a transcendent scorer who was way ahead of his time. Specifically, throughout the course of the 1965 NBA playoffs, playoffs he, he averaged, averaged north, north of 40, 40 points, points per game, game which, which is obviously utterly insane. insane. When you, when you consider, consider the, the fact that he was, he was a perimeter, perimeter shooting, shooting player who, who did, did that before, before there, there was even a three-point three line is, is even more astonishing. astonishing. He has a scoring title to his name and he shot a career 47% from the field, which sounds solid today, but back then that was mind-blowing as he was far above league average efficiency. In fact, several times in his career, he finished in the top five in field goal percentage, even though he was a point guard. I don't think many kids today understand that this man was the very definition of a walking bucket. Number three, Kobe Bryant. What do I have to say about the Mamba that you guys don't already know? He scored 81 points in a single game, 62 points in three quarters, had four straight games with at least 50 points, and nine straight games with at least 40 points. Simply put, he was the best difficult shot maker that the game has ever seen. There is the narrative that Kobe was an inefficient shot chucker, but I honestly think that that's just a thing that's perpetuated by his haters. 
as he spent the vast majority of his career with above average efficiency from the field, from the three point line, and from the free throw line. I do wish he would have retired when he tore his Achilles though, because those last three seasons after the Achilles tear were incredibly inefficient and generally ugly, to the point that it tanked his career averages. Regardless, at his peak, you could argue that he was the most explosive perimeter scorer of all time, as seemingly no one could stop him when he got hot. Averaging 35.4 points per game during the peak of your career is impressive, but when you do it during one of the lowest scoring seasons of modern NBA history is nothing other than completely mesmerizing. Number 2. Kevin Durant This 7-foot sniper is seen by many modern fans as the best scorer ever, and although I'm not willing to go that far, I acknowledge that he's certainly close. Kevin Durant has the versatility to score on anyone from anywhere on the court as he's dangerous in the paint from mid-range and from three-point distance, with a shot that's nearly impossible to defend. Even Kobe Bryant admitted that KD was the one player he hadn't figured out how to defend before he retired. From the day he entered the league to this current day in his late 30s, he's been a dangerous scorer, and he's done it in the regular season, the postseason, and the NBA Finals. In his career, he's led the league in scoring a whopping four times, which is tied for third place for the most in NBA history, all while continuously being a 50-40-90 threat. This resume is strong enough to have him ranked better than everyone in the game's history, with the exception of one. Number 1. Michael Jordan MJ has easily the most scoring titles in NBA history with a total of 10 which means that he led the league in scoring in two-thirds of his career. He has the highest scoring regular season average at 30.1, and the fact that he did it on roughly 50% from the field as a jump shooting guard is completely unprecedented. He has the highest scoring playoff performance when he dropped 63 points against the 86 Celtics number one ranked defense. And when it comes to his clutch scoring, do you really need me to go over the details? He averaged 33 points throughout his career in the playoffs, and with a minimum of 30 games played, no one else has averaged more than 30. When it comes to getting buckets, he almost had no weakness, as he was an incredible leaper and a thunderous dunker, while having one of the greatest layup packages of all time, and while likely being the greatest mid-range shooter of all time. The one thing he's usually criticized for is his three-point shooting, but even that is overblown as MJ was usually shooting right around the league average efficiency from three-point distance. If there's one thing that you need to know about MJ scoring, it's this. Of all players in NBA history combined who were not named Michael Jordan, there have been five times where they won the scoring title and the NBA championship in the same season. MJ did that more times than the rest of league history combined. I rest my case. Here is my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these players have been in the top 5 instead? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments section below. Before I get into my list of the top 5 greatest rebounders, let me first tell you the things I'm considering. 1 is their peak numbers, 2 is their longevity and consistency, 3 is their numbers relative to their era and four is simply the eye test. So now that you guys see the logic, let's get into it. Number five, Dwight Howard. Especially during his prime, this man was a strong bullying force in the painted area. His peak was during the most deflated era of rebounding in NBA history. And with three point shots on the ascension, there was even fewer rebounds to be had for centers. Yet despite all of that, he still got as high as 14.5 rebounds per game in 2012. He led the league in rebounds per game five times in the span of six seasons, and his five rebounding titles is tied with Bill Russell for the fourth most in NBA history. He was able to achieve these feats thanks to his incredible strength and his tremendous leaping ability. Once those aspects of his athleticism started to diminish, so did his gaudy rebounding numbers. Regardless, at his best, he was clearly the best rebounder that the game had to offer. 
Number 4. Moses Malone This 6'10 Hall of Famer was nicknamed the Chairman of the Boards, and for good reason, as he was easily the game's greatest rebounder of his era. Beyond that, I think it's pretty indisputable that he was the greatest offensive rebounder of all time, as he's the game's all-time leader in that category by a wide margin. And that's not just a product of his longevity either. In fact, Malone has all of the top three spots for the highest seasonal average of offensive rebounds per game. In total, Moses led the league in rebounds per game six times in his career, getting as high as 17.6 in 1979. His intelligence and hustle led him to be an absolute monster on the boards. And if second chance opportunities are something that means a lot to your rankings, then you could certainly argue that he should be even higher. Number 3. Bill Russell This legend is usually overshadowed for the fact that he was the second highest rebounder of his own era. But with that being said, he's still definitely worthy of a top 5 spot. Over the entirety of his career, he averaged 22.5 rebounds per game, which is utterly insane, and he got as high as 24.7 in 1964. Now obviously, the 1960s were the most inflated era ever when it comes to getting rebounds, and I'll touch on that more in a bit. But even with that being considered, Russell's numbers were still wildly impressive. He led the NBA on a per-game basis five times in his career, and he was able to do this for a couple of reasons. For one, he had a relentless motor, and was one of the fiercest competitors of sports history. But beyond that, he was also a world-class leaper, who had the opportunity to compete as an Olympian leaper, but instead declined to prioritize his basketball career. Regardless of the era you drop him in, Russell is dominating the boards. Number 2. Dennis Rodman I gotta be honest, I very nearly put this guy in the number 1 spot, and at some point in the years to come, I just might. The Worm doesn't quite have the rebounding numbers of the greats from the 1960s, but what you need to understand is that Rodman played in a much slower era, with fewer possessions, fewer missed shots, and less shots close to the basket due to the 3-point line. Despite the fact that there was less opportunities to get rebounds, Rodman still averaged as high as 18.7 boards per game in 1992. He led the league in rebounding a whopping 7 straight seasons, and in every one of those seasons, the second place finisher wasn't even close. When Rodman averaged 18.7 boards per game in 1992, the average team was averaging 43.7 per game. When Wilt Chamberlain averaged 27.2 rebounds in 1961, the average team was getting 73.3 rebounds a night. So this means there was an average of roughly 60 more rebounding opportunities a night in the 1960s compared to when Rodman played. If you prorate Rodman's 1992 season to the 1961 season, based on the percentage of rebounds he got, he would have averaged a stunning 31.4 rebounds per game, which is easily the highest ever. With Rodman's endless motor, his insane athleticism, and with his all-time great positioning, I truly believe he could have averaged 30 a game in the 60s. But that's just hypotheticals. Now what the guy in the number one spot did is all based on facts. Number 1. Wilt Chamberlain Even with the statistically inflated era, you have to marvel at what Wilt was able to achieve. He has endless rebounding records, like when he secured 55 rebounds in a game while competing against Bill Russell, which immediately destroys the narrative that he was only able to do it because of the inferior competition or like how he averaged 27 rebounds per game in back-to-back -back seasons. Wilt Chamberlain doesn't just have the record for the most total rebounds in a single season, but he also has the second spot, the third spot, the fourth spot, the fifth spot, the sixth spot, and the seventh. His legendary strength and athleticism helped him accomplish these feats and he had the average 6'10 centers who were opposing him looking like inferior high school students. Here is my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these players have been in the top 5 instead? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments section below. 
On my channel, I've talked a lot about the various MVP winners throughout NBA history, but what I haven't done is express my genuine opinion on who the most undeserving MVP winners were. Today, I'm giving you my list, starting with the least egregious to the most egregious. So starting off the list, the fifth most undeserving MVP in NBA history was Joel Embiid in 2023. I gotta admit, sometimes it's very hard to put very recent events on lists like this, because it often feels like we haven't had enough time to process everything and objectively rank it within the grand scheme of history. With that being said, I felt like I just gotta have this recent MVP race on the list. From an individual standpoint, Joel Embiid certainly had a fantastic regular season, as he averaged 33 points and 10 rebounds on 65.5 true shooting percentage. The thing is, there seemed to be a manufactured push to get Embiid the MVP award. The media was pushing it, Embiid was basically begging for it, and voter fatigue was beginning to set in for Jokic, seeing that he had won the MVP award in the previous two seasons. Having Embiid on the list is not an indication that I wasn't impressed by his season. It's just an indication that Jokic's season was significantly more impressive. He played more regular season games than Embiid, he had a better player efficiency rating, a better win share total, and a much higher true shooting percentage. Jokic nearly averaged a triple-double with the highest assist per game average ever for a player at the center position. You really can't say enough positive things about what the Joker accomplished. From an offensive standpoint, you could argue that Jokic had the most efficient season in NBA history. For example, of all players who averaged at least 20 points per game, he had easily the greatest true shooting percentage of all time at 70.1%. At the end of the day, there was no legitimate reason to give the award to Embiid over the Joker. Number four. Bill Walton in 1978. At first glance, Walton may seem like a very deserving MVP this season. For one, his Portland Trailblazers were the defending NBA champions, and he did put up solid numbers of 19 points, 13 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2.5 and blocks on 52% shooting from the field, while finishing the regular season with a 58-24 record. But here's the part you might not be aware of. Walton was dealing with injuries as he always was, and because of this, he only participated in 58 of the Blazers' 82 regular season games that season. That 58 game total is the fewest ever by a player who won the MVP award. The player who he narrowly won the race over was the 25-year-old star George Gervin, who led his Spurs to 52 wins and put up averages of 27 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals on 53.6% shooting. And unlike Walton, Gervin played all 82 games. Honestly, you could argue that George Gervin, David Thompson, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar were all more deserving than Walton was that year based on the fact that he missed nearly one-third of that season. In fact, of the top five MVP vote-getters that season, Walton easily had the fewest win shares. Based on the new modern rule that a player needs to play at least 65 games to win an award, Gervin would have been the league MVP instead, and probably rightfully so. Number 3. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in 1976 from an individual standpoint, no single player was a more dominant and productive presence in the 1970s than the 7 foot 2 inch Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. From a statistical perspective, there's basically no reason why Kareem was undeserving, as he put up monstrous averages of 28 points, 17 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4 blocks on 53% shooting. The thing is, as much as he was tearing up other centers within the league, it wasn't translating to much winning, as his Lakers finished that regular season with a losing record of 40-42 and 42 while missing the playoffs. Even with that disaster of a season, they still gave him the MVP award. I would argue that the only thing that's actually valuable at that point for the team was their draft pick for their losing record. On the other hand, the 1975 MVP, Bob McAdoo, just narrowly missed on winning the award for the second straight season, as Kareem finished with 409 voting points, and McAdoo finished with 393. 
McAdoo led his Buffalo Braves to a solid 46-36 record, while putting up 31 points, 12 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 blocks on 48.7% shooting. McAdoo's Braves obviously made it to the playoffs that year, alongside of their winning record, which is a testament to his important value. Giving the award to a player who missed the playoffs is a highly questionable decision in general, but especially after the 1960s decade where they gave the award to Bill Russell instead of Wilt Chamberlain over and over again, it seemed like a grossly inconsistent decision by the voters, making this specific award in 1976 even less legitimate in my eyes. Number 2. Dave Cowens in 1973 As I was starting to write this script, I was wondering what the heck was wrong with the voters in the 1970s, but I realized it actually makes sense. Seeing how the players did the voting prior to 1979, and they were literally on drugs. Cowens was a fantastic superstar player who is an underrated big man of Celtics history, and he did have a solid season as he put up averages of 20 points, 16 rebounds, and 4 assists on 45% shooting. His Celtics did have an incredible 68-14 record, which helped him secure the award. But here's the thing, he was barely the MVP of his own team, as John Havlicek and Jojo White had comparable monstrous seasons of their own. Then you look at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was barely the runner-up for the MVP award. Not only did Kareem destroy Cowens from a production standpoint, but he was also the clear leader of his Milwaukee Bucks that ended up winning 60 games. Kareem averaged 30 points, 16 rebounds, and 5 assists on 55% shooting, while nearly doubling the win share total of Cowens. Simply put, this should have been in favor of Kareem, and it shouldn't have been even close. Number 1. Bill Russell in 1962 to me, this is the most undeserving MVP award in NBA history. And it's not because Russell didn't have a solid season, but it's because of who he was up against. Russell led his Celtics to a 60-20 record while putting up 19 points, 23 rebounds, and 4 assists on 45.7% shooting. I understand that Russell was the leader of the team with the best record in the NBA, and technically, he gets an edge for being on the winning team. But it's not like Wilt Chamberlain's team wasn't winning as well. Wilt led his Warriors to a 49-31 record, which was the second best record in the East. And he did that while averaging a goofy 50.4 points, 25.7 rebounds, and 2.4 assists on 50.6% shooting. He had a 32-point edge over Russell in points per game, while being more efficient from the field and from the free throw line. He had the edge in rebounds, and he outperformed Russell in basically every advanced stat. The only things you could objectively point to as an advantage for Russell was slightly higher assists and a better team record. But that's not necessarily a reflection of their individual talent that season, but more about their supporting cast, as the Celtics had twice as many All-Stars on their roster. In his career, Russell deserved several Finals MVPs, many DPOYs, and several League MVP awards. But in this case specifically, this one should have gone to Wilt. And as far as I'm concerned, anyone who argues otherwise just wants to be different. Today's list is a rather interesting one. I believe that I am objectively correct about this list, and there is no way I could possibly be wrong simply because it's all based on personal preference. These were the top six most entertaining teams to me, based on a variety of aspects, like how exciting the highlights were, how intriguing the star power was, and how unique and fascinating their style of play was compared to the rest of NBA history. With that being said, these are just the teams that entertain me. So let me know what are your most entertaining teams in the comments section below. Number 6. The 2016 Golden State Warriors To many people, the entertainment value of this squad hasn't aged as gracefully, because nowadays many people are exhausted by the rapid inflation of 3-point shooting. I will say this though. I personally will never forget how mesmerizing the warrior style and execution was back when I was seeing it in the 15-16 season. 
Steph was making over 400 three-pointers in a single season, at a time when no one else had even made 300. He was hitting shots from 30 feet and beyond with regularity and with a level of efficiency that we had never seen before in the history of the game. On top of that, the second best shooter in the entire league was his teammate. Seeing their ball movement, the way they spread the floor, and the way they dominated the game with their perimeter shooting is something that the fans and analysts never thought was possible before they came along. Add on the fact that Draymond Green was a wild card of drama, and add on the fact that Steve Kerr was their head coach, which meant that he had a unique perspective in the comparisons between the 96 Bulls and the 16 Warriors, and what you had was a recipe for some must-see basketball. Number 5. The Lob City Supersonics If the Chicago Bulls dynasty was the hottest ticket in the 1990s, then the Payton and Kemp Sonics were not far behind. Back then, the Seattle crowd always had an electric and energetic atmosphere, and much of that was influenced by the product on the court. That Seattle team loved to run the fast break, and with Gary Payton at the helm, you had one of the best facilitators, and more importantly, one of the best law passers that the game of basketball had ever seen. On the receiving end was none other than Sean Kemp, one of the most athletic and thunderous finishers that I've ever seen. It wasn't just their highlights though, but it was also their personalities. Gary Payton and Sean Kemp were competitive showmen that had an energy level that matched their exuberant home crowd. What made the whole experience even better was the fact that Kevin Calabro was their play-by-play -play commentator throughout the 1990s. Nowadays, he does an excellent job for the Portland Trailblazers local broadcasts. But I personally always preferred him with the Sonics, as he had the perfect voice and energy for the product that was on the court. Number 4. The 99-2000 Shaq and Kobe Lakers now this personal choice has a lot to do with the uniqueness of this team. Phil Jackson was running the triangle offense, and in this system, Shaquille O'Neal was operating as its centerpiece. During the Diesel's prime MVP season, everybody in Los Angeles and on the opposing end of the court knew what the game plan was. The Lakers were going to feed O'Neal, and a collaboration of big men would try their best to stop him and usually, they failed miserably. In the history of me watching basketball, I've never seen a player demand as much defensive attention as Shaq did at that time. He was a freakish anomaly that you only get to experience once in a lifetime. And if that wasn't your cup of tea, they had this young and upcoming player named Kobe Bryant, who was the closest thing we had ever seen to Michael Jordan in terms of his style, his skill, his mentality, and even his body language. He was the lightning to Shaq's thunder, and whether you were rooting for them or against them, you had to appreciate the amazing dynamic of their all-time great tandem. Number 3. The 7 Second Phoenix Suns It's hard to communicate to a younger basketball fan just how unique the Mike D'Antoni and Steve Nash-led Suns were in the mid-2000s. You never hear them say it, but it appeared as if their mindset was that the best defense was double the offense. The tempo was always at a blistering speed, as they believed that the highest quality shot was the one that was taken within the first 7 seconds of the possession. The concept was way ahead of its time, but today it's completely normal in the modern NBA. In that era, they were basically the only team that was pulling up for transition threes basically every other play. It was a foreign concept, and many close-minded analysts claimed that an NBA team could never win a championship with that approach. Although that was true specifically in the case of this Suns team, that playstyle and approach would go on to win championships in the future. You had Steve Nash delivering mesmerizing passes like a basketball magician. You had The Matrix finishing in transition. You had Amari Stoudemire absolutely posterizing defenders out of the pick and roll. And you had an array of three-point snipers from one of the most offensively talented teams of that era. It was a joy to watch. Number 2. The 2014 San Antonio Spurs This one probably isn't the most surprising pick, 
As the 13 of 14 Spurs are frequently documented as one of the most beautiful and intelligent brands of basketball of all time, the team's IQ was off the charts, as Greg Popovich was at the height of his coaching abilities, and basketball veterans like Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, and Boris Diaw, the execution was nearly flawless. Basically, every single player on that team was always looking to make the extra pass, as defenses were often struggling to keep up. It was the perfect blend of fundamentals, discipline, and analytics. Although most hardcore basketball fans appreciate this team today, it's a bit unfortunate that they weren't a bit more appreciated back then, as the quote, boring Spurs narrative was something that was still lingering amongst the casual fans. But for hardcore basketball fans like myself, that absolutely love seeing the game played the right way, with a fluent and selfless style, this Spurs team was the standard of excellence. Number 1. The Showtime Lakers Now before you jump into the comments, foaming at the mouth, calling me biased, let me confirm for you, I am totally biased. I grew up watching this Lakers team over and over again on my dad's VHS tapes, and they were one of the major catalysts that led me to fall in love with the game of basketball. Sure, I look at these Showtime Lakers with rose-tinted glasses, but I think I'm still correct when I say that I haven't seen another team like them in the years since. Thanks to the brilliant split decision making of Magic Johnson, this Lakers team used to treat basketball games like a track meet. Typically, teams will run a fast break when they have the numbers advantage, but Los Angeles didn't even need that. They would simply grab the rebound and immediately push the tempo without a second thought, because they believed they could execute better when the pace was high, and better than the defense could defend it. With guys like James Worthy and Byron Scott as running mates, Magic was constantly delivering no-look passes for crowd-igniting slams. The stars were on the court, the stars were in the crowd, and the game's greatest showman, with his exuberant character, put on the greatest show in basketball. And if, for some reason, that exhilarating pace of play wasn't working, they would simply dump the ball down in the post to the captain, and let him go to work with the most indefensible shot in basketball history, the skyhook. Their impact on the league is still felt to this day, as people continuously refer to transition highlights as showtime. Heading into this upcoming NBA season, everybody is talking about one of the most hyped rookies that we've ever seen in the league, Victor Wembanyama. The jury is still out on whether or not this kid will ultimately live up to the hype, but at the very least, it's got me wondering who are some of the most hyped players in NBA history who ultimately fell short of the lofty expectations. This is not intended to be a ranked list, or even a list that contains all players who fit this category. It's simply my list of players who stand out to me on this topic, and please feel free to make your own suggestions in the comments below. First off, Harold Miner. This 6'5 shooting guard was selected with a 12th overall pick, and although he had some hype going into the draft, that excitement would only continue to grow throughout his rookie season. At the time he was drafted, Michael Jordan was late enough in his basketball career that the league started thinking about the appeal of its product after MJ hypothetically retired. Due to this, the league and the media were desperate to find a successor to MJ, a player who had the athleticism and the skills to be the future face of the league. At least in theory, Miner seemed to fit that mold. He had the build, the ability to play above the rim, and he even had the bald head. Whether it was fair or not, he was one of the very first players to receive the label of the next Michael Jordan. The comparison went so far that he even earned the nickname Baby Jordan. Unsurprisingly, the shoes ended up being way too big for him to fill. Miner didn't end up being the jump shooter that Jordan was, and although the styles were similar, the level of talent was not. Add in several knee injuries to the early years of his career, and it wasn't very long before he was finding it difficult to simply retain a roster spot. He only played a total of four seasons in the NBA before he finally called it quits at just the age of 24. At the end of the day, he shouldn't receive many criticisms because the truth is the comparisons were never really warranted in the first place. Next on the list is Greg Oden. Honestly, I debated whether or not it was fair to include him on my list, 
because unlike most other players in this video, Odin never really had a chance to play an extended period of time before the injuries occurred. In one of the most regrettable decisions in basketball history, the Portland Trailblazers took this 7-footer with the first overall pick in the 2007 NBA Draft. The player they passed up was the future NBA champion and MVP Kevin Durant, who ended up going to the Sonics with the second pick. In hindsight, this seems like quite the boneheaded decision, but I remember the general consensus in 2007, and many people felt like Odin was the kind of player you just couldn't pass up, and some were even predicting that he was going to be one of the all-time great NBA centers. Personally, I don't know if he ever had that kind of trajectory, even if the injuries never occurred. But thanks to his numerous feet and knee issues, that will remain a mystery to us all forever. Next up, Michael Beasley. This 6'9 power forward was a strong scoring monster in college. He was also a solid stretch four, as he was a highly coveted prospect for his fantastic three-point shooting. Heading into the 2008 NBA Draft, some people expected the Chicago Bulls to pick him with a first overall pick, but instead, that ended up being Derrick Rose. At the time, some analysts were even predicting that Chicago would end up regretting their decision to go with Rose instead of Beasley. Now, I wouldn't say he was a bust by any means, as he had a decent length to his career and actually served as a quality role player for some time. At his best in 2011, he averaged 19 points and 6 rebounds on 45% shooting. But what you need to understand is that this man had superstar potential in the eyes of the media and in the eyes of NBA scouts. So even with his decent production, he was viewed as a player who fell tremendously short of the high expectations heading into the league. Next on the list is Andrew Wiggins. Obviously, as an active player who's in his late 20s, you guys all know who this guy is. But in the case of some younger fans, some of you don't realize just how hyped this guy was heading into his NBA career. People were going absolutely insane with the comparisons, saying audacious things like he was a blend between LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. Due to the tremendous hype, he was selected with the first overall pick in the 2014 NBA Draft by the Cavs. Many people thought he had the potential to be the face of the franchise, and would be the one to take the torch from LeBron James after he eventually retired. Well, you guys all know how it goes with LeBron-led teams. Cleveland felt like they were in a position to win immediately with Kyrie Irving and LeBron on the roster. So instead of hanging on to Wiggins, they traded him to Minnesota for Kevin Love. I remember in 2014, I had a buddy who said that Cleveland would regret trading Wiggins for the rest of their lives. Seeing how they went on to win the 2016 NBA Championship with Love on the roster, my buddy's opinion seems comical in hindsight, but he was far from alone with that opinion. The comparison I would make is that people were hyping up Wiggins in the same way they hyped up Jason Tatum in recent years. Unfortunately, Wiggins' drive and work ethic was being highly scrutinized during his first few seasons in the league. And at the end of the day, he's only ended up developing into a borderline all-star at best. Last on the list is Lonzo Ball. As a Lakers fan, this one stings quite deep. With his tremendous confidence, with his solid passing ability, and with his quality shooting in college, people were expecting this guy to be the next major superstar in the NBA. Obviously, his father played a role in that, as he was constantly hyping up his son as if he was going to be the greatest player of all time. Even the famous NBA YouTuber and a huge inspiration for my channel, Mike Korzemba, went as far as calling him Steph Curry with a 40-inch vertical leap. Obviously, a player with that kind of ability would take the NBA by storm. Sadly, Lonzo ended up being nowhere close to where people were projecting him to be. Not only did he not have the shooting ability of Steph Curry, but he didn't even have the shooting ability of the average NBA player as people were calling him the Tim Tebow of the NBA with a massive hitch in his jump shot. As you all know, we as the basketball community eventually tempered our expectations, and Lonzo started to become an appreciated asset with his quality court vision and his passing ability. Tragically, we'll have to wait to see if those abilities will ever make a return to the court due to his degenerative knee issue. So what do you guys think? I realize there are many players who could have been on this list as well, but they're not. I'll leave it up to you guys to put those players in the comment section below. 
Speaking of which, which one of those players that I didn't mention do you think is the greatest example of a player not living up to the hype? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Number 20, the 2011 Los Angeles Lakers. At the time this season took place, Los Angeles was coming off of back-to-back -back NBA championships and appeared as if they were on a collision course with the Big Three's Miami Heat. Considering how a championship would have given Kobe his sixth championship ring and given Phil Jackson his fourth three-peat, it almost seemed like a foregone conclusion that this team would make the NBA Finals. Despite some bumps in the road, they went 57-25 throughout the regular season and defeated the New Orleans Hornets in the first round in six games. But in the second round, they had absolutely no answer for the perimeter onslaught of the Dallas Mavericks, as they were swept in just four games, including the series clincher, where they lost by nearly 40 points. Definitely a disappointing outcome for a team that many people expected to three-peat. 19. The 1973 Boston Celtics it was a handful of years after the departure of Bill Russell, yet this Boston squad was still incredibly stacked, led by their big four of John Havlicek, Dave Cowens, Jojo White, and Paul Silas. Throughout the regular season, they appeared to be on an absolute mission to win their first championship without Russell, as they finished with a dominant 68-14 record, along with the league's number one ranked defense. At the time, that 68 win total was the second highest in NBA history. Unfortunately, they went on to demonstrate how they still missed Russell's poise and leadership, as their success didn't translate to the playoffs. In the second round, which at the time was the East Finals, the New York Knicks, who had won 11 less games in the regular season, defeated the Celtics in 7 games, which at that point made the Celtics the most successful regular season team to fail to win a championship. 18. The 2004 Los Angeles Lakers After the Lakers' disappointing loss to the Spurs in 2003, Los Angeles retooled in the offseason and added two legitimate stars to their already dynamic duo of Shaq and Kobe. Those two acquired stars were the championship-hungry Carl Malone and Gary Payton. With these four Hall of Famers in the starting lineup, Los Angeles was fully expected to dominate the league, and some even expected them to challenge the Bulls' 72-10 record. Well, that didn't exactly happen, as issues arose like Kobe's distracting Colorado trial, drama between Shaq and Kobe, and various injuries to players like Shaquille O'Neal and especially Carl Malone. The team did finish with a 56-26 record and even made it all the way to the NBA Finals. But when they got there, they were absolutely dismantled by the defensively superior Detroit Pistons, who comfortably defeated the Lakers in five games and thus put an official end to the Shaq and Kobe era. 17. The 2014 New York Knicks in the prior year, the Knicks had won 54 games throughout the regular season before they were eliminated in the second round. This was a rare bright spot for a modern Knicks team, and with their star tandem of Carmelo Anthony and Amari Stoudemire returning, along with the recent Defensive Player of the Year winner Tyson Chandler, there was no foreseeable reason to expect New York to be unable to replicate their success. Well, that's exactly what happened. A team that was expected to be a title contender instead finished eight games below 500 at 37 and 45, which landed them the ninth seed in the Eastern Conference, which was just short of a playoff berth. 16. The 1998 Los Angeles Lakers This year specifically is mostly remembered because of the Bulls and Jazz matchup in the NBA Finals. But what many people often forget is that some people actually expected the Lakers to be the ones to represent the West in the NBA Finals. It wasn't without legitimate reason as the Lakers were incredibly talented and had four of their players make the NBA All-Star Game, which only a handful of teams have ever accomplished. Those players were Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, Eddie Jones, and Nick Van Exel. This loaded group finished with a 61-21 record and dominated the first two rounds of the Western Conference playoffs. But in the West Finals, the battle-tested experience of the Jazz was just too much, as they swept the Lakers out of the West Finals in just four games, ruining what would have been an interesting finals matchup between the two greatest shooting guards of all time. 15. The 2020 Los Angeles Clippers after the surprising off-season acquisitions of both Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, many people expected this already talented Clippers team to suddenly be propelled to the NBA championship. 
and the Clippers themselves seem to believe so as well. They did finish with a 49-23 and record, but when the playoffs came along, little of that confidence actually translated to the basketball court, as Paul George's struggles earned him the nickname Pandemic P. As the favorite in the second round, they choked a 3-1 series lead, losing in seven games to the much younger Denver Nuggets. And just like that, the most hyped team in Los Angeles Clippers history once again ended in disappointment. 14. The 2011 Miami Heat This was the first year of Miami's Big Three, which was so hyped that they were the only team in league history to host a freaking concert because of how excited they were. Yes, this team did win 58 games and went on to the NBA Finals. But when you assembled LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh, arguably three top 10 players all in their prime, and you're predicting at least eight titles before the season even starts, then anything short of a championship is going to be seen as a major disappointment. When the finals against the Dallas Mavericks arrived, LeBron James had easily the worst final season of his career, including Game 4 where he famously finished with a total of just 8 points. Ultimately, Dirk Nowitzki and the Mavericks vanquished the Heat in just 6 games. 13. The 2018 Oklahoma City Thunder This was a group with championship aspirations, and based on the talent they had on paper, it seemed somewhat warranted. They were led by the reigning MVP Russell Westbrook, Paul George, Carmelo Anthony, and Steven Adams. Sadly, what looked intimidating on paper didn't translate to the court, as chemistry issues were all over the place and the stars themselves were growing extremely frustrated with their conflicting playstyles. By the end of the regular season, they finished with a shaky 48-34 record and ended up losing the first round in six games to the very inexperienced Utah Jazz. Ever since this moment, all three of these superstar players have been dealing with narratives that have been plaguing their legacies. 12. The 2009 Cleveland Cavaliers A team that in reality was a bit more talented than it's usually remembered for. Obviously, they were led by the league's MVP, LeBron James, who had one of his most impressive regular seasons of his career. But they also had solid contributors like Mo Williams, Zydrunas Ilgauskas, and Ben Wallace. Together, they led Cleveland to a 66-16 record, which was the greatest record in franchise history. They appeared to be on a collision course with Kobe Bryant and the Los Angeles Lakers and the road to the finals seemingly became only easier when Boston's Kevin Garnett got a season-ending knee injury, severely crippling the chances of the defending champions. After going undefeated in the first two rounds, Cleveland was stunned by the underdog, the Orlando Magic, as Dwight Howard and the Magic defeated the favored Cavs in six games, ruining the closest chance we ever got of a Kobe vs. LeBron NBA Finals. Number 11 the 2022 Brooklyn Nets. It's a massive yet fresh disappointment, and some may think it needs to be higher on the list, but for several reasons, I think this is the perfect spot for them. This Brooklyn team obviously had tons of potential, as they were led by the two-time Finals MVP winner, Kevin Durant, who, up to this postseason, was basically always viewed as a big game performer in the postseason. And with a recently greenlit Kyrie Irving by his side, most of us expected better than a weak first round exit. Durant had one of the worst series of his career and was completely outplayed by the much younger Jason Tatum. The only reason I don't have this one higher on my list is because it wasn't quite as surprising as the ones ahead of it. With all the injuries, the missed games by Kyrie Irving, the short term appearance of James Harden, and all the chemistry issues that come with that, all under the supervision of a rookie head coach, I honestly can't justify putting them in the top 10 when the writing seemed to have been on the wall for some time now. Number 10. The 1970 Boston Celtics This was Boston's first season after the departure of Bill Russell, and although losing their legendary center is a massive blow, they were still loaded with talent, led by a handful of Hall of Famers including John Havlicek, Bailey Howell, Tom Sanders, Jojo White, and Don Nelson. Obviously, an adjustment period was expected, but a complete and utter failure was certainly quite a shocker. The most affected area was their team defense, as they went from a perennial top two defensive team to the bottom half of the league. The defending champions not only finished with a losing record, but it was with an abysmal 34-48 record as they missed the playoffs entirely. 
In the 75 years of NBA history, this Celtic squad is one of only two teams to miss the playoffs as the defending champions. Number 9. The 1994 Seattle Supersonics After Michael Jordan's first retirement to go play baseball, many teams saw this as their golden opportunity to win an NBA championship and the Seattle Supersonics were one of those teams. Led by their highlight reel tandem of Gary Payton and Sean Kemp, along with key contributors like Detlef Schrempf and Kendall Gill, the Sonics absolutely dominated the regular season as they were a top three team both offensively and defensively while bolstering the league's best record at 63 and 19. In the first round, standing in their way was the young and unproven Denver Nuggets, who had won 21 less games during the regular season. After Seattle got off to a 2-0 lead, they stunningly choked away the series, losing three straight games to the eight-seeded Nuggets. Since the creation of the league, this was the first time an eight-seeded team had ever defeated a number one seed in the playoffs. Number eight, the 1997 Houston Rockets. Shortly after the Rockets repeated as NBA champions with their tandem of Akeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler, they added a third superstar to the mix the Hall of Famer Charles Barkley. With this three-headed monster, Houston had one of the most intimidating squads on paper that the league had ever seen. With this veteran and championship level experience, Houston finished the regular season with a 57 and 25 record and eventually made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals. Unfortunately for them, that's where they ran into Malone and Stockton of the Utah Jazz. The chemistry of the Houston roster just wasn't clicking to the same extent that it was for Utah, and due to this, the Jazz eventually won the series in six games, and the Rockets would go down as one of the more notable Big Three failures of all time. Number 7. The 1962 St. Louis Hawks This Hawks squad had made it all the way to the NBA Finals in four out of the previous five seasons, and for good reason. With star players and Hall of Famers like Bob Pettit, Clyde Lavellette, Lenny Wilkins, and Cliff Hagen, St. Louis was loaded with talent as they had firmly established themselves as perennial contenders. The thing is, their star point guard, Lenny Wilkins, was called upon for military service due to the Berlin Crisis, which resulted in Wilkins playing a total of 20 regular season games. Having your veteran floor general participate in only one quarter of the season will obviously have an impact on your team, but to simply say that it had an impact would be a gigantic understatement. The talented Hawks were tremendously disappointing as they finished the regular season with an awful 29-51 record, which not only resulted in them missing the playoffs, but they were the second worst team in the entire league. Definitely one of the more rarely mentioned disappointments of basketball history. Number 6. The 2014 Brooklyn Nets Thanks to an aggressive front office, the Brooklyn Nets organization had a win-now mentality, and it resulted in a blockbuster trade that landed both Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce in Brooklyn. Rounding out the roster was plenty of talent, and on paper, Brooklyn appeared to have one of the most intimidating starting fives in the entire league. Unfortunately for them, there's a lot more to the game of basketball than simply acquiring talent. The age was beginning to show for both Pierce and Garnett, and the team ended up finishing in the bottom half of the league defensively. Not to mention how these five stars missed a combined total of 129 games due to injuries. They finished with a 44-38 record in the regular season, before eventually losing in the second round in just five games to the battle-tested Miami Heat. Number 5. The 1984 Philadelphia 76ers the year prior, the 1983 76ers dominated the league, and even the postseason, as they lost only one playoff game on their way to the NBA championship. The 83 76ers are considered as one of the greatest basketball teams of all time, and it makes sense with a lineup of Moses Malone, Julius Irving, Andrew Toney, Maurice Cheeks, and one of the all-time great defenders, Bobby Jones. So with the roster jam-packed with Hall of Fame talent, all returning the following season, you would think that they would be able to replicate some of that success. Well, they actually didn't come close. The defending champions went 52-30 and 30 throughout the regular season, before they were shockingly upset in the first round by the New Jersey Nets, who defeated them in five games. Simply put, Philly choked, as the entire starting unit was healthy for the playoffs, yet their defensive effort was extremely lacking, as they allowed the Nets to exceed 100 points in all five games. Number 4. The 2013 Los Angeles Lakers 
The Lakers front office shook the basketball world when they acquired both Steve Nash and Dwight Howard to go along with their already proven championship tandem of Kobe Bryant and Pau Gasol. Many people were predicting this team to challenge the Bulls 72-10 record and an eventual NBA Finals matchup with the Big Three's Miami Heat seemed as if it was a foregone conclusion. Well that wasn't the case, as the Lakers got off to a slow start and were having chemistry issues, and additionally, Dwight Howard didn't seem to be in his same athletic form after his off-season back surgery. They fired the head coach Mike Brown just five games into the regular season, and his replacement, Mike D'Antoni, didn't fare much better after that. Every one of the Lakers' star players dealt with injuries throughout the regular season, and right as they finally started to hit their stride just in time for the playoffs, Kobe Bryant famously tore his Achilles tendon. They finished with a 45-37 record before they were swept out of the first round by the San Antonio Spurs. Number 3. The 2007 Dallas Mavericks After a loss in the NBA Finals to the Miami Heat in the previous season, Many people viewed 2007 as the year the Mavericks would get their revenge and win the NBA championship. And for a while, it kind of looked like that was going to be the case. Dirk Nowitzki had a monstrous regular season and secured his first and only league MVP award. With a top five defense and the league's second best offense, these powerful Mavericks finished with a 67 and 15 record, which wasn't only the best record in the league, but it was easily their best record in franchise history. All of that just made it all the more stunning when they were upset by the 8th seeded Golden State Warriors in the first round. Despite winning 25 less games over the course of the regular season, the Warriors controlled all of the energy and the momentum of the series, as they wrapped it all up in just 6 games. Nowitzki was actually awarded his MVP after the historic disappointment, which honestly made for one of the most awkward press conferences that I've ever seen. Number 2 the 2022 Los Angeles Lakers. Sure, it's recent history, but it's history nonetheless. On paper, this appeared to be one of the most overpowered teams of all time, but in reality, it was basically a dumpster fire. Playstyles were in conflict of one another, defensively, they were lazy, and injuries definitely played a significant role as well. The Lakers were projected to win 52.5 games over the course of the regular season, yet they finished with only 33. That's the greatest deficit from the preseason odds that the league has ever seen. It's one thing for a team with LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and Russell Westbrook to miss the playoffs, but the fact that they missed the play-in tournament altogether is a level of disappointment that I never could have imagined before the season started. Number 1. The 2016 Golden State Warriors Ultimately, they were just 5 points short of winning the NBA championship, but when you consider the context and gravity of their disappointing failure, I can't find myself putting this team in any spot other than number 1. They were led by their star trio of Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green. Their franchise superstar, Steph Curry, had just won his second straight MVP, which was also the only unanimous MVP award of league history. Not only were they the defending champions, but objectively, they were the best regular season team of NBA history, as they finished with a record-breaking 73-9 season. Even throughout the regular season, the media was constantly comparing this team to the 1996 Chicago Bulls, who most people consider as the greatest team ever. Little did we know how poorly that comparison would age. It's one thing for the greatest regular season team to fail to win a championship, but what adds another level of disappointment was the manner in which they failed. After building a 3-1 series lead in the NBA Finals against the Cleveland Cavaliers, Golden State managed to choke away the next three games straight, ultimately losing the series in seven. Heading into the playoffs, they were arguably the strongest title favorites that we had ever seen, and to fall that far after being in that kind of a commanding position is a level of disappointment that may never, ever be eclipsed. For as long as the NBA has been in existence, star players have been making their mark on the league with what we call signature moves. They may have not necessarily been the inventor or the originator of the move, but in these cases, they were the first to implement it as a regular and lethal part of their game. The thing is, for various reasons, people often get it wrong when it comes down to these signature moves. We often acknowledge a more recent player, probably for the simple fact that it's what the wider audience is familiar with. 
But with a more broad understanding of basketball history, we begin to understand how that can be somewhat disrespectful to the players who were doing it before them. Today, we're looking at a handful of players who I believe are incorrectly given credit as the originators of their moves. First off, Steph Curry and the D3. I'll admit, it's not common for a player to willingly take three-point shots several feet beyond the line, especially in the 90s. But with that being said, there was at least a couple players who were doing it. The first one that comes to mind was the Phoenix Suns' Stan Marley. Marley played for several teams throughout the course of his career, but it was in Phoenix where he truly made a name for himself as he made three all-star teams and was arguably the most reliable 3 and D type of player in the entire league. To this day, it slightly annoys me when people act like Steph was the first player to willingly shoot several feet beyond the three-point line. Because even as a younger basketball fan, I remember Marley doing this with regularity in Phoenix. Not as often as players in the modern game, of course, but it was often enough for it to be seen as his own signature move. Many of Marley's bombs were also provided in clutch moments, where his team absolutely needed each point. Although I truly believe that Marley was the pioneer of this, there was a few other players who would do it occasionally as well, like Portland's Rasheed Wallace, Vince Carter, and even Kobe Bryant with his heat check shots. Second up is Dirk Nowitzki and the Dirk Fade. Dirk Nowitzki's fadeaway jumper has become iconic, and given the fact that he's a 7-footer, it's one of the most difficult shots to defend of basketball history. Stylistically, it's very different from the fadeaways of guys like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. But with that being said, he still wasn't the first player to regularly implement this style into his jump shot. Decades before Dirk ever played his first professional game, Wilton Norman Chamberlain was scoring over the top of centers with that style of a fadeaway. Contrary to popular belief, this was a pretty common method of scoring from Wilt, as it was not only well known among his peers, but there's also entire compilation videos on YouTube of Wilt making these shots. Seeing how he had an extremely high release point, how he's 7 foot 1 inches tall, with a 7 foot 8 inch wingspan, and how he had an elite vertical leap, Wilt bolstered arguably the most indefensible fadeaway that the game has ever seen. Even in his prime, when Chamberlain was averaging 50 points a game, many of those baskets were coming from his Dirk-like fadeaway on a nightly basis. Next is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the sky hook shot. Speaking of difficult shots to defend, one of the rarest and most famous came from the Lakers captain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The sky hook shot usually comes from a player who plays the center position, and with its sky high release point, there's very little the opposing player can do to alter it. The vast majority of Kareem's 38,000 points were scored with this move, so obviously it comes as no surprise that it's most often associated with the NBA's all-time leading score. The thing is, he wasn't the originator of this move, not even close, as many players were doing it for decades before him. The first superstar to incorporate it into his game and use it with extreme lethality was the first Lakers legend, George Mikan. Not only did the 6'10 big man win numerous championships as the Lakers leader, but he was also the man who frequently carried the team offensively, and the bread and butter of his offensive arsenal was a sky hook shot. If I haven't yet made my point of just how powerful and integral this shot was to his game, consider this. For three straight years, Mikan led the league in scoring with a near 30 points per game average, and he did this at a time when entire teams were averaging around 80 points per night. It was Mikan's dominant sky hook that made that kind of an offensive impact possible. Next is Isaiah Ryder and the East Bay Funk Dunk. The between the legs dunk has become a staple of the NBA dunk contest and it doesn't appear to be leaving anytime soon. Players continuously try to find different variations of this dunk as a means to gain higher scores with the judges. The thing is, the popular belief among basketball fans is that Isaiah Ryder introduced it in 1994, Kobe Bryant solidified it in 1997, and Vince Carter made it iconic in 2000. But before each and every one of those instances, a player did the between the legs dunk in a dunk contest, but unfortunately, no one seemed to remember it. It came by a gifted athlete by the name of Orlando Woolridge in 1984. This was actually the first dunk contest of NBA history, and the winner of that contest was actually the Phoenix Suns' Larry Nance. With that being said, it was Woolridge who made history earlier in the contest when he made this East Bay dunk. 
The response from the audience was somewhat tame, as they didn't realize the history that they just witnessed. Apparently, some of the judges didn't either, as Orlando's dunk only amassed a total of 48 points. This dunk went so under the radar that many basketball fans still believe that Ryder was the originator of it in the NBA. But if you ever hear any fans say such a thing, be sure to remind them of this forgotten gem. Lastly is LeBron James and the chase down block. I will not argue that LeBron isn't the greatest chase down blocker of all time, but on that note, you would be wrong to think that he was the first player to do it with some level of regularity. Among his many skills, chase down blocks were a legitimate part of Akeem Olajuwon's game, as he had the speed, length, and athleticism to catch up to opposing players and punish them for going up softly. He didn't do it as often as LeBron has, but it was certainly within the Hall of Famer's skill set, and a couple of those instances were in some tremendously significant playoff games. There have been numerous instances in NBA history where the league or a player within the league got the fans' hopes up with something they said or promised, but unfortunately, those hopes never became a reality. Here's my five biggest instances where the NBA let the fans down. Number 5. LeBron James's Dunk Contest Promise LeBron James is one of the most powerful and ferocious dunkers that the league has ever seen. His incredible athleticism and his astonishing ability to finish above the rim haven't just been displayed in actual basketball games, but he's even been known for putting on a show during warm-ups as well. This has resulted in LeBron being one of the most desired participants for the dunk contest, ever since he started playing professionally in 2003. Well, in 2009, the NBA was especially struggling to create interest for the NBA's dunk contest, and was desperate to relive the glory days, where some of the greatest players in the world competed. So in the middle of the 2009 dunk contest, Cheryl Miller interviewed LeBron and asked him point blank if he was planning on participating in the dunk contest the following season. And LeBron said the following. Right now, I'm preliminary putting my name in the 2010 yeah, Dunk Contest on Saturday night. LeBron right. James is saying that in 2010 right. in Dallas Stadium, that's right. primarily I'm putting my name in the Dunk okay. Contest. Right. Obviously, LeBron did not actually go on to participate in 2010, which was disappointing in and of itself. But what made it worse was how terrible the 2010 Dunk Contest ended up being as the Lakers Shannon Brown was a huge disappointment and no one really stole the show besides him. The funny thing is, he could still make it right and put on a show in the dunk contest if he really wanted to. Number 4. Wilt Chamberlain vs. Muhammad Ali in the Boxing Ring You guys have heard me talk about plenty of crazy things concerning Wilt Chamberlain, but one of the craziest is how he nearly fought the greatest in the sport of boxing, Muhammad Ali. It all started on Howard Cassell's show in 1967 when Wilt challenged Ali to a fight, but it wouldn't gain serious momentum until a few years later. Even at a time when media wasn't nearly what it is today, there was a ton of coverage about this possible fight, as both potential competitors were doing a tremendous amount of trash talking leading up to the event, which was scheduled to be at Madison Square Garden. Although Wilt would be out of his element, he did certainly have the physical advantages, as he was 7 foot 1 inches tall, weighing about 275 pounds, and he had a 92 inch reach. Compared to Ali, who was 6 foot 3 inches tall, weighed about 210 pounds, and had a 78 inch reach. When asked for a prediction on the fight, Ali responded with just one word. Timbo! <laughs> Will Chamberlain agreed to fight Muhammad Ali for a total of $500,000 after taxes. But when the time came to sign the papers and make it official, the contract said that Chamberlain would be getting $500,000 before taxes. Wilt, being upset about this, decided to decline the fight. Ali was insistent upon making it work, so he said he would equally split the purse of $1.5 million with Chamberlain. But Wilt refused that too. Even though Wilt made the challenge, Ali was definitely more insistent on making the fight happen. But at the end of the day, Wilt decided that it wasn't enough money to make it worth the time and the effort. Let me know in the comments who you think would have won the fight and in what fashion. Number 3. Shaquille O'Neal vs. Hakeem Olajuwon in a televised game of one-on-one. -on -one. In 1995, Shaq and Hakeem were at the center of the debate for the title of the best big man in the entire NBA. But Hakeem basically squashed that debate as soon as the NBA Finals were played in June. It was between Shaq's Magic and Hakeem's Rockets, but
but it was hardly a contest as the Rockets swept the Magic in just four games. Although both centers played extremely well and each put up strong numbers, it was clear which big man had firmly established himself as the man on top of the basketball world. This narrative didn't sit very well with the Diesel, who said he believed that he was still the better big man. So Shaq sent this letter to Elijahwan, challenging him to a game of one-on-one, -on -one to settle the score once and for all. Hakeem actually accepted the challenge, and hype began to swirl around the basketball world. This was such an anticipated and expected event that there was even television ads to promote the showdown. Unfortunately, Hakeem Olajuwon injured his back leading up to the event, and the matchup had to be cancelled just a day before they were set to square off. Shaq was later asked in an interview if he thought Hakeem was just looking for an excuse to back out, but Shaq had too much respect for the dream and said that he didn't believe that was the case. Let me know in the comments who you think would have won in that one-on-one -on -one scenario. Number 2. The Chris Paul Trade to the Lakers I won't talk about this one too much because I have quite a bit in recent videos, but when the trade went down in the winter of 2011, basketball fans only had about an hour and a half to anticipate a Chris Paul and Kobe Bryant tandem before news broke that the league office had blocked the trade. Obviously, the biggest disappointment for basketball fans as a whole was how it ruined the chances of a Kobe Bryant vs LeBron James NBA Finals, which is one of the most unfortunate realities of NBA history without question. Number 1. The NBA claiming that it would crack down on flopping and then doing basically nothing. A lot of people wouldn't consider this one to be anywhere close to the top spot, but what you need to understand about me is that I absolutely hate flopping. As an old school basketball fan, I see flopping as a constant reminder of how much the league has softened since the golden days when I first started watching the game. I don't really blame the players though, since flopping does give them a competitive edge. It gets the other team in foul trouble, it can make a regular foul look like a flagrant, and in the cases of guys like James Harden, it can earn you a lot of easy extra points at the free throw line. It's not like guys didn't flop back in the day. Because trust me, guys like Vladi Divac and Danny Ainge were frequent floppers, which is a big reason why I didn't like either of them. But throughout the years, it's only become worse and worse as it's now a regularly practiced strategy on a widespread level. It got bad enough that in 2012, the NBA established that it would be fining its players for flopping. The rule stated that any player who flops during the regular season would first be warned followed by fines in increments of $5,000 for each successful flop during the season. I remember when this announcement first happened, and I, along with many other basketball fans, was beyond thrilled, thinking that this would be the move to eradicate this pathetic acting out of the league. Well, the problem is, the league has since painfully under-enforced the rule. In the past 10 seasons of the rule being established, there have only been a total of 31 fines given to the players. Despite his reputation, Chris Paul has never been fined, James Harden and LeBron James have been fined only once, and in the last two seasons of the NBA as a whole, there have been zero fines distributed to all of the players. And a lot of these flops that I've been showing on screen took place in the last two seasons. So again, it's not mainly the player's fault, but the league office for refusing to enforce the rules like they're serious about it. One can only imagine how much better the league would be today if the league office actually grew a spine and enforced the rules like they meant it. I've been telling other basketball fans over and over again that Michael Jordan's undefeated 6-0 finals record isn't impressive simply because he never lost on the game's biggest stage, but it's because of how he performed in each of those series. The 6-0 record isn't some random arbitrary stat, but rather it's indicative of how Jordan was the ultimate performer when the games mattered the most. As requested by a faithful viewer, here's my ranking of Jordan's finals MVPs throughout his career. Number 6, 1996. This was the easiest selection on the list, as Jordan's finals MVP over the Supersonics is the only one that is sometimes debated upon concerning whether or not he actually deserved it. Although I understand the impact of Dennis Rodman, and although I've watched this series in its entirety numerous times, I still think MJ was clearly the most deserving player from Chicago. In a grit and grind defensive series in which the Bulls' entire team averaged only 93 points per game, every bit of Jordan's offensive impact was needed. His stat line was somewhat underwhelming by his own standards, 
but by the standards of just about any other superstar, this would be considered a fantastic showing. With that being said, it's still unquestionably in the last spot on this list, as it was not only his lowest scoring final series of his career, but it was also his most inefficient. Yes, he did go up against the revered Supersonics defense, but this is far from the only time on this list where Jordan was up against an elite defense. Number 5, 1997. His first finals against Utah was incredibly impressive to say the least. But even while being great, it's possible to not be enough to secure one of the top few spots on this list. To begin the series, Jordan was dealing with an extra layer of motivation as Carl Malone was narrowly named the league MVP ahead of him. When asked about it in a pre-finals interview, Jordan was very blunt about the fact that this MVP selection motivated him. You know, yeah, Carl, you won MVP this year, well, this is the MVP of the finals, you know, this is, you know, winning the championship, this is the leader of your team. At the conclusion of Game 1, Jordan's statement appeared to be extremely prophetic, as Carl Malone not only missed both of his crucial free throws while the game was on the line, but then Jordan went on to bury his iconic game-winning jumper to secure the first game of the series. Later on in Game 5, Jordan had his famous flu game performance, where he dropped 38 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3 steals on 48% shooting. Over the course of the 6 game series as a whole, MJ averaged 32.3 points, 6 assists, 7 rebounds, and 1.2 steals on 45.6% shooting. Jordan's offensive dominance was even better than what his stat line indicated, as the entire Bulls squad averaged only 87.8 points per game. Which means that between Jordan's points and assists, he counted for over half of the team's total offense over the entire series. When it was all said and done, MJ did end up showing Carl who the true MVP was after all. Number 4, 1991. Jordan's first championship was quite impressive, and some may even go as far as calling it his most impressive, but for a couple reasons, I don't think that is quite the case. It was the long-awaited bout between the two greatest guards of basketball history, Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. In this series, MJ showed that Magic wasn't the only guard in the series who could distribute, as he poured in 31.2 points, 11.4 assists, 6.6 .6 rebounds, and 2.8 steals on 55.8% shooting. Obviously, a player averaging north of 30 points per game while averaging double-digit assists is a rare occurrence for any playoff series, let alone the NBA Finals. Clearly, his efficiency was incredibly stellar, which includes his dominant performance in Game 2, where he had a stretch where he made 13 straight field goals without a miss. The thing is, as great as this 5 game series was from MJ, one of the reasons I have a hard time giving it a top 3 spot was the fact that Jordan took full advantage of an extremely shorthanded Lakers team, as both Byron Scott and James Worthy were dealing with injuries, which made them miss time and affected their defensive play while they were on the court. Number 3, 1998. As far as I'm concerned, Jordan's last finals appearance makes it into the upper half of this list, as it was an epic final chapter to his career in Chicago. It wasn't his most efficient series from the field, and it wasn't a well-rounded series statistically. But what he did do was carry an injured and tired Bulls roster offensively on a historic level. Throughout the six-game series, neither team scored 100 points even a single time. In fact, the two teams eclipsed 90 points in only two instances. To put it simply, it was a grit and grind type of series that was slow paced and was defensively minded. Yet even with that being the case, Jordan averaged an astonishing 33.5 points per game over the course of the series. The most notable example of him carrying the offense was in the championship clinching 6th game, where he scored 45 of the Bulls 87 points. That's the highest percentage of a team's total points in NBA Finals history. With Scottie Pippen dealing with immense pain in his back, Jordan didn't have a choice but to carry the Bulls offense, and to simply say that he did that would be a tremendous understatement. Number 2, 1992. Coming up in the runner-up spot is Jordan's second championship run against Portland, where he immediately began proving his naysayers wrong and breaking NBA records. Heading into the series, the narrative being pushed by the media was that Clyde Drexler of the Blazers was not only as talented as Michael Jordan, but that he was clearly the much better perimeter shooter. 
After all, Clyde shot more than three times as many three-point attempts as Jordan did throughout the regular season and was also significantly more efficient. Unsurprisingly, Michael took offense to this, and in an interview just days prior to Game 1, MJ said that Clyde is only a better shooter than he chooses to be. Obviously, MJ then made it a point to prove the naysayers wrong, and began firing away from three-point range shortly after tip-off. Jordan set the NBA record for the most three-pointers made in a Finals half, and he also tied the record for the most threes made in an NBA Finals game. In that first half of Game 1, he also dropped 35 points, which is still, to this very day, the most points ever scored in a half of an NBA Finals game. Jordan's scoring dominance and precision from the perimeter would only continue throughout the course of the series, as he averaged 35.8 points, 6.5 assists, 4.8 rebounds, and 1.7 steals on 52.6% shooting. Jordan was so accurate that he nearly had 50-40-90 percentages over the course of those finals. Along with that, Jordan had a commanding performance in the crucial fifth game in Portland, where he dropped 46 points on 61% shooting from the field. MJ also contained Drexler below his scoring average and well below his usual efficiency. An absolutely incredible display from Jordan in his prime. Number 1. 1993 this isn't just the most impressive final series of Jordan's career, but it's arguably the greatest finals performance in NBA history. Against Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns, Jordan exploded offensively, averaging more points than anyone else ever has in the finals. Jordan overall was the leading scorer in all six games, and dropped at least 40 points in four out of those six games, including a 55-point eruption in Game 4. Over the series, he averaged 41 points, 8.5 rebounds, 6.7 assists, and 1.7 steals on 50.8% shooting. Jordan also shot a solid 40% from three-point range while leading all of the Bulls players in three-point attempts. What's rarely mentioned is how Jordan did all of this against the best defender in the league at the shooting guard position other than himself, which was the second team all defender, Dan Marley, who was utterly torched by MJ time and time again. If Michael fails to have an outstanding performance in any one of these evenings, then the Bulls likely lose the series as a result. But again, this is one of the many reasons why most basketball fans consider him as the greatest player of all time, as Jordan never failed to excel when he was on the game's biggest stage. So what do you guys think? How would you rank Jordan's six finals MVPs, and would you be interested in seeing me do a ranking for any other players? Let me know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.